debate on motion number 8327. In the name of Alex Neil, on the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill, members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Alec Neil to speak to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, you've got 16 minutes. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. I move the motion in my name for the Chamber to accept Stage 1 of the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill. This bill makes a number of changes to the law on marriage and civil partnership, but the centrepiece is obviously the legalisation of same-sex marriage, and I believe that will allow all people having the same opportunity as each other in Scotland who love each other to have their marriage recognised in the eyes of the law. That will create a more tolerant... That will create a more tolerant society in Scotland and will mean that in respect of marriage there is genuinely equal rights right across the entire community. The bill also makes provision so that married transgender people can obtain gender recognition and stay married, removing the need to divorce. That provision will make a huge beneficial difference to the lives of transgender people and their spouses. I will turn later to the detail of the bill and in particular to the points made by the Equal Opportunities Committee's report. But before doing so, Presiding Officer, I want to give a brief overview of the provisions of the bill generally. The bill contains a number of changes to marriage law which have been planned for some time and some other changes to ensure marriage ceremonies in Scotland continue to be carried out with due solemnity and dignity. The bill provides greater flexibility on where civil marriage ceremonies can take place. It permits civil marriage ceremonies to take place at any location agreed between the couple and the registration authority so long as the place is not religious premises. The bill also clarifies the position of belief celebrants and puts them on the same footing as religious celebrants. That is a welcome change, recognising the role which, for example, humanists play in solemnising marriage in Scotland. And the bill increases flexibility in relation to civil partnerships and allows the religious or belief registration of civil partnership where the religious or belief body is happy to take part. Whilst providing greater freedom and flexibility for couples generally, the bill also ensures that marriage procedures in Scotland remain rigorous. For example, the bill clarifies the offence of bigamy, and a number of provisions in the bill show that we will not tolerate sham or forced marriage in Scotland. Sham and forced marriages are real problems in Scotland today, and I pay tribute to registrars and others across Scotland who are vigilant in tackling these issues. The bill extends a normal notice of period for marriage and for civil partnership from 14 days to 28 days. This reflects the reality of the length of time it can take to check that a person is eligible to marry or enter into a civil partnership it is also a deterrent to sham marriages. The bill allows the district registrar to require specified nationality evidence when a couple is seeking to enter into a marriage or a civil partnership. Such information may be needed for a variety of reasons, e.g. statistical. Again, though, this requiring this evidence could combat sham and forced marriage. The bill also empowers ministers to make regulations on qualifying requirements for religious and belief bodies to meet before its celebrants could be authorised to solemnise marriage or register civil partnerships. Scotland has a rich diversity of religious and belief bodies that can solemnise marriage, and that is very welcome. But it also means we need to make certain the dignity and solemnity of the ceremonies is upheld. The qualifying requirements could cover such issues as not carrying out ceremonies for profit or gain and awareness of forced and sham marriage. We will consult widely with religious and belief bodies and others before making any regulations. I know that religious and belief bodies share our determination to ensure that marriage ceremonies remain dignified. 
Equally, though, the state must not interfere with the internal workings of religious and belief bodies, and we need to ensure a reasonable balance is struck. Will the Cabinet Secretary take an intervention? Of course. Check, bro uh, what provisions, Cabinet Secretary, thank you for taking the intervention, what provisions are there in the bill to avoid situations in extremists that may occur where one party challenges the other, and this possibly forces action contrary, contrary to Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights? Cabinet Secretary. I'll come to the detail of those kind of issues in the, a minute later on when I discuss the uh, recommendations from the Equal Opportunities Committee. Uh, coming to same-sex marriage, which I've already referred to, presiding officer, respect for religious beliefs and views have also been at the heart of our work on same-sex marriage, and we have consulted twice. We have not consulted any more in any other bill in this parliament than we've consulted <coughs> on this measure. There's also, of course, been a detailed examination of the bill at stage one by the Equal Opportunities Committee led by Margaret McCulloch and latterly by Mary Fee. Of course. Alex Johnson. Could I ask the Minister if he can clarify at this point exactly how he intends to deal with the issue of the 4,100 consultation submissions which were apparently lost through no fault of his own? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we've found them and we'll put them on the website. <laughs> but uh, as you see, uh, as the member says, it wasn't through any fault of the Scottish Government. Uh, there was a technical hitch by those who submitted the 4,100. Uh, I know the detailed examination I referred to earlier by the committee has been challenging and I want to pay tribute to the committee and in particular to the two conveners who have uh, been convening the committee during that period, Margaret McCulloch and Mary Fee and all their other colleagues on the committee. Throughout the consultations and the stage one process, the government has acknowledged the diversity and strength of religious beliefs. In the foreword to the first consultation, my predecessor, Nicola Sturgeon, emphasised, quote, that this government believes in religious tolerance and the freedom to worship, end quote. And we recognise, although we disagree, that some people of faith sincerely believe that marriage should be between and only between one man and one woman. Of course, there's a rigorous, uh, a vigorous and respectful debate on same-sex marriage in many religious bodies, as there is across society and this parliament. Some religious and belief bodies wish to solemnise same-sex marriage, and so the bill, I think, provides a balanced and fair package. Of course. Richard Lyle. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, my wife and I adopted our daughter some 30 years ago. Would you agree with me that since my wife and I do not support same-sex marriage, we would not be allowed to adopt today, or questions would be asked of our suitability to adopt or even foster, whereas people like us equal rights? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, be believing or opposing same-sex marriage is no barrier of itself to adoption, a uh, presiding officer, and I'm happy to write to the member to clarify the law on adoption in relation to same-sex marriage. Uh, of course. Andrew Fraser. Uh, he will know that currently a Roman Catholic adoption agency is having its uh, charitable status threatened because it does not recognise same-sex couples. What guarantees can he give us that if this bill passes, uh, those uh, faith groups and service providers who do not recognise same-sex marriage will not similarly have their charitable status in any way questioned? Cabinet officer, this matter is currently under legal appeal and therefore it would be inappropriate for me to, to comment uh, on that particular instance. But uh, can I say I'm happy to clarify these matters more generally, uh, either in this debate tonight or uh, by writing to the member. Uh, the bill that we are discussing tonight establishes an opt-in system for religious and belief bodies in relation to same-sex marriage and civil partnerships. The bill makes it clear that there is no duty to opt in, and the bill imposes no duty on any person who is an approved celebrant to solemnise same-sex marriages or to register civil partnerships. In addition, the UK Equality Act 2010 will be amended. This amendment will protect individual celebrants who refuse to solemnise same-sex marriage from court actions claiming discrimination. Same-sex marriage will not be introduced in Scotland until this amendment to the Equality Act has been secured, which I believe it will be. We have reached agreement with the UK Government about the Equality Act amendment and have published a detailed statement on what is planned. 
As we have indicated, the amendments will also cover other persons who play an integral part in the religious or belief aspects of the marriage or civil partnership ceremony. And they will protect a person controlling the use of religious or belief premises who refuses to allow the premises to be used for a same-sex marriage or civil partnership. Presenting officer, we have carefully considered, of course, Jamie Hepburn. At present, the state dictates what the position of each uh, religious denomination should be on this matter. It explicitly does not allow them to marry those of same sex uh, who want to enter into a, a, a marriage. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the approach the Government has taken is actually uh, empowering religions to make a decision? In this sense, it is about the freedom of, of religion. Cabinet Secretary. Ab absolutely. There, there are a number of religious organisations and churches who are actually very much in favour of this uh, legislation, the Quakers being a very good example, because up until now they have not been allowed to carry out same-sex marriages, and they want to be allowed to carry out same-sex marriages. Uh, can I say, presenting officer, that um, we uh, have carefully considered the need for wider protections across society also as a whole. Uh, these are challenging issues and we have to respect re religious beliefs while at the same time making sure there is no discrimination against the LGBT community or individuals. We also need to avoid interfering with the employer-employee relationship. And we need to balance parental rights in areas such as education with the rights of the child to receive a full and comprehensive education. Therefore, the protections we're introducing more generally are a mixture of legislation and guidance. The bill has provision at section 14, making it clear that the introduction of same-sex marriage will have no impact on existing rights to freedom of speech, thought, conscience, and religion. In addition, the Lord Advocate has issued prosecution guidance. This makes it clear that criticism of same-sex marriage or homosexuality is not in itself an offence. The guidance adds that, quote, views expressed or comments made in relation to same-sex marriage in ways which do not incite hatred or violence towards a particular person or group and which do not cause or intend to cause public disorder will not be the subject of criminal prosecution, end quote. I would add that the vigorous debate on same-sex marriage during our consultations and whilst the bill has been in Parliament shows that freedom of speech is very much alive and well. John Mason. Uh, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with the QC at the committee who said that that guidance had no binding effect legally. Cabinet Secretary. No, not at all. That, that is guidance uh, to by the Chief Prosecutor to every prosecutor in Scotland to say that it has no impact is absolute nonsense in my view. Of course it has impact. It decides what will be prosecuted and what will not be prosecuted in Scotland. Uh, and I think this is the right approach, Presiding Officer. These detailed issues are uh, best... Uh, sorry, I'll now come to education uh, as well. We have sought views on updating the guidance on the conduct of relationships, sexual health and parenthood education, and we have received around 60 responses. We are currently considering the points made by those who commented on the draft guidance. Where teachers have concerns about educational material that they might have be asked to use, we have said that they should raise their concerns within the school or the local authority, and we believe that is the right local approach. Such detailed issues are best discussed and resolved at a local level rather than trying to dictate from the centre. There is also existing guidance which reflects the professional standards which teachers have to meet when giving classes. It, similarly, we have indicated that we are opposed to a legislative opt-out from same-sex marriage for civil registrars and that any issues or concerns should be dealt with at a local level by employers. In terms of the committee report, the committee has asked us to take account of views expressed by stakeholders on matters such as the protection of celebrants. We will, of course, do that. We have kept an open mind throughout this bill process, and I believe that is shown by the balance package that we have put forward. The committee also makes a number of other recommendations. We will consider the point raised on the distinctions between religious marriage and belief marriage. As the committee noted, we consider points here following the second consultation. It is not a straightforward matter to come up with designations that would please everybody, and the committee has suggested that couples in a non-Scottish civil partnership should be able to change the relationship to a marriage in Scotland. 
We do need to respect non-Scottish jurisdictions and also ensure that we do not cause confusion on the civil status of the couple. However, we will consider in detail the point raised by the committee. On gender-neutral marriage ceremonies, we have written to a number of religious bodies to seek their views on a change in this area. We do have concerns about the committee's recommendation on spousal consent. It is spousal consent to stay in the marriage, and it takes two to stay in a marriage. As the committee notes, the spouses of people seeking gender recognition may find themselves in circumstances that are very difficult to face. We will, though, consider the point further, aiming to balance the rights of everybody. On long-term transition people, we will seek to lodge an amendment at stage two to introduce provisions similar to what was added to the UK Act in the House of Lords. And finally, we will respond in detail on lowering the age at which applications can be made to the Gender Recognition Panel. We need to obtain more medical and psychological evidence of the potential effect of any possible change, presiding officer. But I recognise the points made in evidence provided to the committee and acknowledge the, the need for the government to think further about the issue. In conclusion, presiding officer, I strongly urge my fellow MSPs to vote for this bill. This bill makes sensible improvements to marriage and civil partnership law. It provides greater flexibility for couples seeking to get married or enter into a civil partnership. It introduces same-sex marriage, which will further promote equality and diversity in our society, while respecting the views of those who do not wish to take part. I believe the provisions of this bill will improve our society that we live in here in Scotland and make it a much more civilised society in how we treat LGBT people. And I look forward to the debate, and I ask my colleagues to support the general principles of the bill at the vote at 8pm tonight. Thank you. Can I remind uh, people in the gallery not to applaud? I now call Margaret McCullough to speak on behalf of the Equal Opportunities Committee. Ms McCullough, you've got 11 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this opportunity to speak on behalf of the Equal Opportunities Committee following our Stage 1 report on the Marriage and Civil Partnership Bill. Before I introduce the report and speak about our conclusions, I would like to extend my thanks to the clerks, all of my committee colleagues, as well as members of other committees which have considered the bill namely the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I also want to thank everyone who responded to our call for written evidence and everyone who took part in oral evidence sessions in September and October. All of us in the committee recognise the validity, strength and sincerity of the views we have received on what is clearly an emotive issue. I am personally grateful for the sensitive and respectful way in which those views have been presented by witnesses and then considered by committee members. I hope that the wider debate about same-sex marriage can proceed in that same dignified way. Presiding officer, the committee noted the different views expressed in evidence on the meaning and purpose of marriage. We considered evidence from faith groups and from LGBT people on their perceptions and understanding of marriage and we heard from a range of witnesses about rights-based arguments and social attitudes. Some emphasise the concept of... Com no, I'm, I'm carrying on. I don't have time. I really have to go through all this to complete the report. Some emphasise the concept of complementary, complementarity between men and women. The Catholic Parliamentary Office, on behalf of the Bishops' Conference of Scotland, wrote, the complementarity of male and female and their unique role in the transmission of life underscores the reality of marriage as a natural social environment for the birth and growth of every person. John Deegan from the Catholic Parliamentary Office described complementarity as the inherent essence and rational basis for marriage. However, John Phillips, representing the Religious Society of Friends, or the Quakers, gave a different perspective, saying, for us, the crucial thing is the complementarity between two individuals, who are making a committed relationship with each other. Tim Hopkins from the Equality Network says, 
Our view is that Belle is about love, and marriage is about love. I think if you ask most married couples what their marriage is about, they will say it's about love, a commitment to each other, and if they have children, their family. All those things apply to same-sex couples as well. Colin McFarlane from Stonewall Scotland says the bill is about much more than the complementarity issue. It's about how gay people are viewed in society, about being equal in the eyes of the law. Indeed, we gave a great deal of consideration to equal recognition, human rights and public attitudes, and Dr Kelly Coleman highlighted to us the transformative power of right-based arguments in this debate. I am aware that many of the responses to the Scottish Government's consultation were not favourable to this bill. This point was made to the committee in written evidence and in oral evidence from John Deegan. Ross Wright from the Humanist Scot Society of Scotland, however, commented that a consultation is not a referendum. Professor John Curtis from Strathclyde University advised that we should not look to consultations as a way of understanding the balance of public opinion, but instead the structure of public opinion and technical issues with bills and proposals. There was clearly a huge amount of diversity as well as depth in the views we received, and I hope that the whole range of opinions is adequately reflected in the report. Presiding officer, the committee also noted varying views among stakeholders on the approach taken in the bill towards protecting celebrants of faith, as well as the freedom of religious organisations to conduct legal marriages in keeping with their own doctrines. We heard different views in the opt-in approach for religious and belief celebrants, protections for service providers and concerns about attrition. In our report, we asked the Scottish Government to consider that range of views in the amending stages of the bill. Under the Marriage Scotland Act of 1977, there are two types of marriage ceremony, civil and religious. Since 2005, humanist celebrants have been authorised under a provision of the 1977 Act designed for the temporary authorisation of religious celebrants. The bill would retain two categories, but would redefine non-civil marriage ceremonies as religious and belief ceremonies to capture a wider range of beliefs and put religious and belief celebrants on the same legal footing. Ephraim Borowski from the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities considered that there was a distinction between religious and belief ceremonies, and so belief ceremonies should actually form a third category. The committee notes the Scottish Government's explanation as to why the bill retains two categories of ceremony, However, we have sought the Scottish Government's views on a potential amendment to the Bill. Presiding Officer, the Committee took a range of evidence on civil partnerships, including the difference between marriage and civil partnerships, the treatment in the Bill of civil partnerships registered abroad, and the future of civil partnerships in Scotland. We note that the Scottish Government plans to consider issues relating to reform of civil partnerships including civil partnerships for opposite-sex couples in its forthcoming review. Should same-sex marriage be introduced, there would be a procedure for converting civil partnership into marriage. We believe that couples who enter into a civil partnership abroad, who would have to dissolve their partnership before marrying here, should have similar rights to that procedure as couples whose civil partnership has been conducted in Scotland. Presiding officer, the committee noted the Scottish Government's position that it has struck the right balance regarding gender neutral ceremonies and that allowing such ceremonies could cause problems for denominations that might not want to use gender neutral marriage declaration. However, we believe that it should be possible to allow gender neutral language, and that is why we called on the Scottish Government to reconsider its position. We note evidence calling for the requirement for spousal consent to be removed from the gender recognition process. The spouses of people seeking gender recognition may find themselves in circumstances that are difficult to face and we haven't received specific evidence from their perspective. However, we believe that the non-transition spouse's personal choice is sufficiently, is sufficiently protected 
by the automatic grounds for divorce, triggered by his or her partner seeking gender recognition. We therefore believe that the requirement for spousal consent for gender recognition, also known as a spousal veto, is unnecessary and should be removed. We have also drawn two further conclusions regarding gender recognition issues raised in evidence. Firstly, we have welcomed the Scottish Government's willingness to consult on difficulties facing long-term transition people, particularly around evidence requirements, with a view to amending the Bill at Stage 2. Secondly, we have noted representation made by the Scottish Transgender Alliance about lowering the age at which a person can secure gender recognition. We accept that it may not be possible to deal with these issues effectively within the scope of this bill, but nonetheless, I feel it is important to highlight these points to the Chamber. Presiding officer, the committee took evidence on how the bill could impact in other areas of life, including the education system and chaplaincy within public services. We heard from John Brown from the Catholic Education Commission and Michael Caldwell from the Family Education Trust, who spoke about the conflict between different views of marriage and the implications they fear that it could have for teaching in schools. However, when asked whether the bill would have an impact on how teachers taught in the classroom, Stephen McCrossan from the EIS says, I do not think that the bill will have a significant impact on the way in which teachers teach in the classrooms. We simply see the bill as another strand in equality and diversity, promoting equal opportunities and challenging discrimination. On behalf of the committee, I would draw the Parliament's attention to the views expressed regarding the relationship between the bill and public services. I would also draw attention to the recommendations put forward by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, which we note and support. Presiding officer, to paraphrase Robert Louis Stevenson, we agree to differ, for agreeing to differ is a form of agreement rather than a form of difference. The majority of the committee supports the general principles of the bill and recommends that Parliament approves the bill as stage one. A minority of the committee doesn't support the bill because they disagree in principle or because they're not convinced that adequate protections are in place. We are unanimous, however, in supporting the rights of individual members to decide on this bill as a matter of conscience. On a personal note, let me say that I know what my conscience is telling me. I associate myself with the majority of views expressed in the report. I back the general principles of this bill, and I hope there is a majority for equal marriage when we vote tonight. Thank you. I now call Jackie Bailey. Ms Bailey, you've got 11 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to participate in this Stage 1 debate on the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill. Can I at the outset commend the Scottish Government? Not something I do terribly often, but let me commend unreservedly the Scottish Government for their work on the Bill and commend the Equal Opportunities Committee, both members and clerks, for their diligence in scrutinising the Bill at Stage 1 and associate myself with the Cabinet Secretary's remarks about Mary Fee as the former convener and Margaret McCulloch as the current convener of the Committee. There has undoubtedly been a volume of evidence, both in favour and against the Bill, and their Stage 1 report is a comprehensive record of that evidence and the process of the Committee's consideration of the Bill. And whilst the report notes that the majority of the Committee support the general principles of the Bill, it was right for the Convener to remind us it is the case that it will be a matter for individual MSPs, as I believe all parties have agreed that there will be a free vote. So ultimately, it is a matter for each one of us in this chamber. I therefore recommend that all members read the Stage 1 report. I know it's long, but it does actually helpfully set out the arguments and where there are concerns, the scope for amendments. And I will come on to consider some of these concerns later. But you know, for me, this bill is about equality. It's about fairness. It's about social justice. It's about values instilled in me by my parents, by my community, and by society. And for many of us, this is also about how we see ourselves as a nation and how others see us, about the values that we hold and whether Scotland is indeed a confident, progressive nation where equality is truly valued. Now, most of us 
will have received a considerable volume of correspondence about equal marriage, both for and against. Many of the arguments are very detailed. The views are passionately held. I mean, some of us were even receiving emails as we're walking into this chamber, never mind receiving emails late last night. And I thank people for their time and their energy in informing the debate. But it is true to say that attitudes in Scotland are changing. In the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey in 2002, 41% of people were in favour of same-sex marriage, 19% were against. In the same Social um, Attitudes Survey, but this time in 2010, the number of people in favour of same-sex marriage had risen to 61%. Now, a 20% shift in opinion on any issue in such a short space of time is frankly astonishing. And if you begin to unpack the detail of this, the support for equal marriage can be found in those who are religious, from people across all income groups, and from all geographical areas of Scotland. So this cuts right across our country and right across our society. <coughs> Now, of those surveyed, 55% of those identified themselves as Catholic, supported same-sex marriage. 21% were opposed. For Scottish Presbyterians, 50% supported same-sex marriage. 25% were against. For those living in the most deprived areas, 67% support same-sex marriage. And for those living in the most affluent areas of our country, 63% support same-sex marriage. And frankly, it makes no difference whether you live in urban or rural Scotland, support for same-sex marriage is roughly the same and consistently above 60%. So there is no doubt about where public attitudes currently stand. Now, I read with much interest Professor John Curtis's evidence to the committee. Many of us here um, know him better for inhabiting television studios in the wee small hours of the morning, sharing his wisdom on elections and voting behaviour. But he described to the committee a cultural shift in Britain over the last 30 years. Now, according to Professor Curtis, in 1983, 62% of the population believed that same-sex relationships were mostly or always wrong. That figure has dropped to 28%. That is quite extraordinary. His explanation for that shift is that increasingly it is young people that support same-sex marriage. The Equality Network back this up and tell us that support for same-sex marriage is highest amongst those who are under 55. I, like many in this chamber presiding officer, will take that as a compliment that being under 55 is still considered to be young. But, you know, joking apart, there is robust and credible evidence of changing views in our society and support for equal marriage. It is also useful to consider what has actually happened in other countries that have legislated for same-sex marriage. In Europe, since 2001, we've seen the Netherlands, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, France, and most recently, England and Wales all provide equal marriage rights for same-sex couples. In Canada, South Africa, Argentina, New Zealand, Uruguay, Brazil, and 17 states in America, equal marriage is the norm. Now, I know Portugal quite well. as like Christian Allard, one of my parents was Portuguese. 81% of the population of Portugal describe themselves as Catholics. Now, that's quite a huge proportion of any country. That is without doubt in my mind, a significant number. Portugal passed their law to allow same-sex marriage in 2009. It was hotly contested, there is no doubt about that. It was passed to the constitutional courts for review. But those same courts in 2010 said it was perfectly legal and the then president, Cavaco Silva, signed it off and there have been same-sex marriages ever since. Now, one Portuguese friend, interestingly, who was also quite religious, told me when I asked him about the legislation, he said, you know, it's about love. There should be no difference whether it's a man or a woman, or if there's the same sex, it's whether they love each other that really matters. When this parliament passed the law on civil partnerships, I think we took a huge step forward. Same-sex couples had the legal rights associated with marriage. But I recognize that for some, this falls far short of marriage where their love and commitment is fully recognized. The Equality Network talk about a gold standard. For me, it is a matter of equality and fairness. So for a host of different reasons, I believe that equal marriage is an idea whose time has come. 
and I will be supporting the general principles of the bill later this evening. But that said, very few in this chamber are deaf to the concerns that have been raised. A principal area of concern appears to relate to the protections put in place by the Scottish Government. It is the case that no religious or belief body can be forced to perform a same-sex marriage. It is also the case that celebrants will not be forced to perform a same-sex marriage if it's against their beliefs. And I agree with that. These are matters of doctrine and belief that are properly matters for the church and not the state. Religions can and do, in a second, religions can and do already refuse to marry people. This is a matter for them currently, and it is not proposed that this change. Mark McDonald. Uh, the member has just made the point that I was going to make, which is that the, the, the church is already able to choose who they marry. Jackie Bailey. I'm always not keen to give up time to the member, um, but I'm glad on this point we are in agreement. But, you know, I, I, I do welcome um, that, that point because, you know, it is important. But I acknowledge that there are some people who are concerned that even those protections um, might be challenged in the court. So I welcome very much the arrangement between the Scottish Government and the UK Government to amend the UK Equality Act of 2010. The 2010 Act already contains provisions about not discriminating when providing a service, and there are exemptions for religious and belief bodies, but these apply in certain circumstances. The Scottish Government, rightly in my view, has sought to make the protection more comprehensive by asking for a further amendment that would indeed help to allay fears about challenges being brought on grounds of discrimination. It is helpful that an agreement has already been reached with the UK Government on this point. Concerns have also been expressed about whether this would affect someone's employment if they held views which were opposed to same-sex marriage. The example most often cited um, is that teachers somehow would be forced out of their job if they refused to teach about same-sex marriage because they were fundamentally opposed to it. Now, I think we would all acknowledge that teachers deal with difficult situations each and every day in school. They do so in the main sensitively, balancing their own beliefs with the needs of the child or the children before them. I think it would be wrong to put something on the face of the bill when education circulars and guidance have served us extremely well in the past. There is existing legislative provision that allows parents to withdraw their children from religious education. There is existing guidance that allows parents to withdraw their children from sexual health education. And I welcome the Scottish Government's proposal to update this guidance to reflect the introduction of same-sex marriage. It is also the case that faith aspects of the curriculum in Catholic schools will continue to be a matter for the Scottish Catholic Education Service. But that said, I think it is important that the Scottish Government review any suggested impact on education to make doubly sure of the position. And I, like many other members, have received very thoughtful letters from teachers, both supporting the proposal and those concerned about how they should deal with same-sex marriage. So updated guidance will undoubtedly be helpful. Equally, I have no doubt that amendments will come forward that seek to respect the right of those that, as a result of their religious beliefs, that consider the traditional view of marriage as being between a man and a woman. Concerns, too, have been highlighted about freedom of speech, and whilst I note the Lord Advocate has published guidance on the matter and noted the provisions in the European Convention on Human Rights and the Charter for Fundamental Rights on the, the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion, along with freedom of expression, but, you know, despite that, concerns remain. And I suspect the Parliament, quite rightly, should explore this again to make sure it's robust. And the committee has asked the Scottish Government to look again at the gender recognition provisions in the bill. Policy areas such as gender-neutral language, spousal consent for gender recognition, and so on. Presiding officer, I've not had time to explore in detail all of the areas that have been raised by the committee, but you have the fortune or misfortune, depending on your viewpoint and hearing from me again in the closing speeches of the debate. But in conclusion, I hope members will support the general principles of the bill at decision time tonight. We in the Scottish Government have work to do to improve the bill to make it more robust. We need to ensure that there are adequate protections that genuinely address people's concerns. But it is time for change. It's time to support equal marriage. I now call Ruth Davidson. Ms Davidson, you've got seven minutes. Thank you. Presenting officer, this debate is not easy and I don't think it was ever going to be. Where areas of love meet the law, where belief, commitment and faith collide with legislation, the waters will always be difficult to navigate. I therefore commend all of the contributors to this debate over the past few months and years who have sought to make thoughtful contributions 
to elevate the ideas and to temper the language, displaying a respect for beliefs which differ for their own, but recognising that those beliefs are just as sincerely held. And I hope that that temperance will continue this evening, demonstrating that while this may be a fledgling parliament, it has a maturity too. And it is precisely because of the nature of this debate that I believe that this bill is a matter of conscience. And that's why, similar to other parties, Scottish Conservative members have been given a free vote. So today, I speak on behalf only of myself. Uh, in fact, I have no doubt that this will possibly be the most personal speech I ever make in this chamber. And I hope to explain why I support the broadest principle of this bill, and that is the principle of extending marriage. I believe in that principle because I believe in marriage. I believe that marriage is a good thing. I saw the evidence of that every day growing up in a house that was full of love. And while my own family had all the stresses and strains that were common to all, there was never any doubt or question or fear in my mind that our togetherness was in any way insecure. And the bedrock of that stability and security was my parents' marriage. And that stability helped me and my sister to flourish and have confidence that we could be whoever we wanted to be. More than 40 years married, and my parents still love each other. And I look at what they have, and I want that too, and I want it to be recognised in the same way. And that recognition matters. Presiding officer, from childhood, you have known without even thinking that if you found someone that you loved and who loved you in return, you had the right to marry them. That same unthinking right to marry is extended to the Cabinet Secretary. The leader of the Labour Party has that right also. So too does the leader of the Liberal Democrats. I want that right to extend not just to me, but also to the thousands of people across Scotland who are told that the law says no. They can't marry the love of their life. They're not allowed. And unless we change this law, they will never be allowed. And it does matter, presiding officer. It matters that a whole section of our society is told that they can have the facsimile of civil partnership, but they can't have the real thing. It's not for them. Their love is something different. It's something less. Their commitment is denied. I don't want the next generation of young gay people growing up, as I did, believing that marriage is something they can never have. We have the opportunity with this bill to change that and to change the attitudes and even the stigma that being lesbian, gay, bisexual or transgender can still evoke and which can cause so much harm. Jamie Hepburn. I, th I thank Ruth Davidson for giving me and what I think is a very eloquent uh, contribution that I'm enjoying very much. You spoke about the next generation. I'm the father of uh, two uh, very young children. I, I don't know what their sexual orientation will be, but in the circumstances that they uh, grow up and have a same-sex attraction, what would the member say uh, if this parliament failed uh, to legislate for the provision that's before us today? What would she suggest I would say to them uh, in futures if they wanted to be married? How, how would she think I could look them in the face and say this parliament uh, missed the opportunity to give them that right? Well, I would hope that their father had helped vote them the opportunity to have that going forward. And I think that talking about the next generation is important because it is them for whom we must think of. Last year, the University of Cambridge conducted a huge body of research. It was called the School Report. And they spoke to hundreds of LGBT pupils right across the UK who were open about their sexuality. A majority said that they were the victims of homophobic bullying and that it happened to them in their school. More than half deliberately self-harmed. Nearly a quarter had attempted to take their own life on at least one occasion. These are our children. And they are made to feel so much guilt and shame and despair. And we have an opportunity today to make it better for them. Because at the moment, we tell these young people, we tell them, you are good enough to serve in our armed forces. You're good enough to care in our hospitals. You are good enough to teach in our schools. But you're not good enough to marry the person you love and who loves you in return. We tell them, you are something different, something less, something other. And that marriage, that dream, that gold standard, that does not apply to you. You don't get to have that. And that apartheid message, that same but different, that alien quality, that otherness, that is what is reflected in every hurtful comment, every slander, every exclusion and every abuse, whether it takes place in the school playground, in the factory floor or in the local pub. And that's why this bill matters. 
It matters, yes, to those people who will directly benefit from it, those couples today who are eager to commit their relationship and marriage and who I believe should be allowed to do so. But more than that, it matters to the future nature of our country because we have an opportunity today to tell our nation's children that no matter where they live and no matter who it is that they love, there is nothing that they can't do. That we will wipe away the last legal barrier which says that they are something lesser than their peers. We can help them to walk taller into the playground tomorrow and to face their accuser down, knowing that the parliament of their country has stood up for them and said that they are every bit as good as every one of their classmates. A parliament that has said that they deserve the same rights as everybody else. Presiding officer, I believe in marriage. I believe it is a good thing and to be celebrated. And I want everybody in Scotland to know that marriage is open to them. I support the principles of this bill. We now move to the open debate. Can I say to members that I have got 20 members who wish to take part in the debate? I am absolutely determined that those who have indicated already their wish to take part um, are heard. Um, it's, it's a unique debate in that it is a free vote, and I want as many voices heard as possible to allow everybody to get in who has already indicated they wish to speak. Um, the first number of speakers, I can allow six minutes, and there afterwards, it will be five minutes. And the presiding officer will tell you when that change occurs. Um, I now call Marco Biaggi. Thank you, presiding officer, and apologies for not noticing earlier that we were running slightly ahead of schedule. Uh, this evening, as it is becoming clear to everyone, is different to the bills where we debate policy or the intricacies of law. And speaking personally, like Ruth Davidson, I can only feel that this is much more immediate, more fundamental, and a question very much of my own personal civil rights. And after consideration, I concluded that, that my remarks, too, must really reflect that. It's not going to come as a surprise to anyone that, that when I was young and my classmates were starting to notice girls, I started to notice boys. And I was afraid. I looked at our society and I did not see myself looking back. Not in our institutions like marriage or in what was publicly at the time debated as good and moral or even in how our society portrayed itself in fiction where any representation of same-sex attraction made the subject matter adult ranked alongside pornography and violence. And when all I saw or knew of gay people was Julian Clary or Kenneth Williams or Graham Norton, I, a boy from a chip shop in Dumbartonshire, did not see myself. I could only conclude that what I was was different from normal and that what I was was less deserving as a result. Today, this chamber can add a new tile to a, a great interlocking mosaic of our society that has been steadily built up one piece at a time since the Wolfenden Report of 1957. Same-sex marriage will not be the last piece to add to this mosaic. And today's bill is not the finished article, not least for the transgendered. But today we can further build a picture of our society that generations of young people to come can look at and see themselves in. And people of faith, whether gay or straight, must see themselves in that image too, because it would be perverse to expand the freedom to express sexuality only at the cost of freedom to practice faith. Both are fundamental cornerstones of a humane society, and the dichotomy between them is a false one. Amending UK equality laws puts beyond doubt any concern that churches could be forced to hold same-sex marriages by domestic law. Anyone can speculate about hypothetical European challenges, but ECHR also includes specific protection for freedom of religious practice. I quote, there would be quite a hurdle and a strong protection under Article 9 if churches can prove that they are not part of the state. The Church of Scotland is not and has never been a department of the state. Not my words, but those of Aidan O'Neill QC, legal adviser to the campaign against the bill when he gave evidence to the Equal Opportunities Committee. And if the Kirk doesn't class as a department of state, then which faith 
would. Together with the EHRC and Karen Monaghan, a human rights law specialist, there was consensus that the protections were strong, that the freedom of religion was genuine. But we don't have to speculate. Nine countries in Europe have already legalised same-sex marriage. Not one has seen churches forced to hold them. A fact confirmed to the Equal Opportunities Committee not once, not twice, but three times over by different witnesses. And above all, we must not be drawn so much by this remote and hypothetical challenge to religious freedom that we overlook the very tangible, very real and very much ongoing violation of personal freedom, that is the exclusion of people of same-sex attraction from expressing their love through marriage, the institution our society considers the paragon of commitment. Civil partnerships were a welcome step, but they remind me of the ladies' degrees that were offered before women were admitted to Scotland's universities on an equal footing for the first time in 1892. Those ladies' degrees were progressive for their time. They opened the door. But who today would argue that a woman-only degree was a substitute for allowing women to study on the same terms as men? Civil partnerships are separate but equal, which is always separate and never equal. They are not enough. And who are we if we were to surprise everyone and vote down this bill today to continue to infringe the freedom of those progressive faiths like Scotland's Quakers and Scotland's Unitarians who sincerely consider same-sex ceremonies part of their understanding of what marriage is and should be? Thank you. Is the member aware that um, last month marked the 50th anniversary of the publication of a book towards, called Towards a Quaker View of Sex? I want to quote from it. Um, surely it is in the nature and quality of a real relationship that matters. One must not judge by its outward appearance, but by its inner worth. Homosexual affection can be as selfless as heterosexual affection, and therefore we cannot see that it is in some way morally worse. Does the member agree with me that that conclusion, which was unprecedented in its time 50 years ago, is still significantly more advanced and, and, and progressive than some people have managed during this debate? Kubiaji. Well, I very much agree with the sentiment that was expressed, although I would speak up for Unitarians who have also been performing same-sex blessings since the 1950s. There is plenty of progress all round. But who are we? Who are we to say, if we were to vote down this bill, that other faiths who do not share that have an understanding of the sacrament of marriage that should be allowed and those views forbidden? Unless we somehow believe that same-sex relationships are intrinsically different, wrong and worthy of legal proscription. And I cannot bring myself to believe that any of us in the Chamber subscribes to that view. But let me tell you a secret. I did once. And the shame of those days has given way now to a shame that I did fight those feelings for such a long time. And sadly, I know too many who still fight them, people young and old whose lives are a daily denial. I don't have to imagine how it feels to live like that because I remember it. When I came out, it was the time I stopped looking at those around me and wishing I was the same as them and instead started to wish I had the same rights as them, the same right to love, to marry, the same right to dream of what might be. Today's bill grants to people across Scotland that right, the freedom to be true to their faith and their love. And I implore all members to join together and endorse it this evening so that for all those people, young and old, well, what a sign that would be. Can I just remind members that the debate is going to be really, really tight if I want to get everybody in, so can I urge you, beg you in fact, to keep to your time limit. I now call Mary Fee to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate is truly historic, long overdue, and one I am delighted to take part in as a supporter of LGBT rights. I also believe it will come as no surprise that today I'll be saying I do. Before I go any further, I must pay compliments to the Equality Network, the Transgender Alliance, Stonewall Scotland and all the equality groups that played their part in the campaign that now results in this chamber making its first vote on the bill that will make marriage equal in Scotland. The debate has often been contentious, particularly when played out in the media, and I am sure that all in this chamber will be sincere and courteous in their deliberations tonight. 
The Scottish Parliament was established to promote the values of social justice and tackle inequality. And since its inception, it's acted against social and moral inequality by repealing Section 28, levelling the age of consent, allowing same-sex couples to adopt and foster, and introduced legislation to ensure that LGBT people are protected under hate crime laws. And it's only right that we extend the rights and freedoms to LGBT citizens that many of us take for granted each and every day. And to the opponents of the bill who comment that civil partnerships were introduced for LGBT people, let me say just this. Were the suffragettes happy in 1918 when the representation of the People's Act was introduced, allowing women over 30 to vote? No, they were not. And they fought for a further decade to enfranchise all women and equalise the voting age of men and women. Lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender couples that wish to marry should be able to do so. They should not be told they must accept the current two-tier discriminatory system that we have in place. And adapting our marriage laws will end this discrimination with no impact to any other marriage. Our society has become increasingly liberal since 1999, and attitudes towards the LGBT community are changing, even if it does sometimes feel at a snail's pace. And support for equal marriage is at an all-time high. And my vote tonight also represents the majority of correspondents I have received from constituents in the West of Scotland. While it's highly recognised and documented that attitudes are changing, the levels of stigma and discrimination towards LGBT people remain unacceptably high. And like many, I believe that same-sex marriage will help to tackle and reduce prejudice. I'm presiding officer on the specifics of the Bill and Equal Opportunities Committee Stage 1 report. There are still changes that need to be made, and it's likely that amendments will be put forward that improve the opportunity to increase equalities. However, I welcome the considerations made by the Scottish Government and the Equal Opportunities Committee to report on issues such as gender recognition difficulties faced by long-term transitioned people and civil partnerships performed in another country. The committee report also raises questions over the meaning and purpose of marriage. Those against the bill use the complementarity of a man and a woman as the basis of marriage. And this suggests that the basis of the marriage was really about procreating. However, as we know all too well, the ability of creating a child does not automatically create a perfect parent or indeed an ideal family unit. And it seems that some are living in a different society to the rest of us, and outdated values serve no justice to the children of today. And as I said earlier, we have become more liberal, and single parent families are increasing as well as becoming more accepted as the norm. And in suggesting that marriage is the basis for a stable environment for raising a family adds to the stigma that many single parents feel and does no service to the tremendous work and support that many single parent families do every week. Marriage is a commitment between two loving and consenting adults, whether to have children after that point or indeed before or never is a decision solely for that couple, no matter how that family was created. And the legislation that came into force in 2009, allowing same-sex couples to adopt, was also long overdue, giving the right to offer a child a safe, stable and loving home. And presiding officer, having been married for 36 years and raised two children, I strive to understand how introducing this legislation takes anything away from my marriage. And I agree with the First Minister for probably the first and maybe the last time when he stated at the Scottish Government Cabinet meeting in Renfrew last year, I personally struggle to see whose freedoms are being infringed by the move towards this legislation. That being said, it's right that freedom of thought, freedom of religion and freedom of speech is protected. However, at what point does one freedom overtake the equality of others? As many supporters have said, there are enough safeguards for people in expressing their view as long as it is, it is not seen to be hateful or discriminatory. And in summing up, presiding officer, this legislation is a step 
if not a leap, in ensuring equal rights for all Scots and will hopefully add to the important and crucial work carried out to tackle inequality and discrimination. And I look forward to casting my vote in support. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on John Mason to be followed by Elaine Smith. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to take part in the debate today. Clearly, we are dealing with a very sensitive subject, and it has, there has been a certain amount of strident language in the media from people at both ends of the spectrum. However, I think it was encouraging at committee that there was a generally reasonable tone, both from committee members and witnesses. And that tone was important because whether Scotland is devolved or is independent, we must be able to disagree amongst ourselves in a civilised way. I believe that that is what this Parliament is for. We do not all need to be the same as each other. We do not all need to agree on one point of view. But I want, and I hope we all want, a pluralistic and an inclusive Scotland, which is made up of a wide variety of people and groups, and where people of different backgrounds, orientations, people with traditional faiths or none, can all belong and feel at home. I think we have to note as well that Parliament is not reflecting public opinion on this issue. It can be argued whether those supporting or opposing the bill have the greater numbers on their side, but there is certainly not the overwhelming support outside this place that there seems to be inside. So Parliament needs to tread wisely if it is to keep all the people of Scotland on board. If it's brief. Dr Harvey. I'm, I'm grateful. Would you accept that as well as strong feelings uh, among certain people on both sides of this argument, there's an awful lot of people out there who are just puzzled that we haven't got over this already? Well, there's people puzzled who haven't gone over it already. There's people puzzled why we're looking at it when they think there's other things that are more important. I think we do need to deal with this subject sensitively, as I think Ruth Davidson uh, gave us a tremendous example of, as we're talking here about personal relationships. We have people who have a relationship with a partner they love and want the right to marry them. We have people in a loving marriage relationship who feel that these changes could devalue that relationship. And we have people like myself who have a relationship with Jesus and want to show our love for him. So let us all accept that and try to at least tolerate a range of views. I think there are two main arguments against this bill, one on the principle that marriage is between a man and a woman, and secondly, whether there are adequate safeguards in place for those who disagree. The latter is a concern which comes on top of the feeling of some religious people that they are being increasingly marginalised in society. On the principle eh, that the argument is the word is about marriage, has, and ma the word marriage has had a recognised meaning for a very long time. And some people would argue that Parliament cannot or should not change that meaning by widening the meaning. And it, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go on. It dilutes the value. Now, from personal perspective, I have a lot of sympathy for that argument. However, this raises the question of how much our faith or my faith as a personal position should decide how I vote on an issue like this. Coming from a Baptist perspective, I believe strongly in the separation of church and state. And while state has responsibility for restricting some actions and behaviour, it cannot ultimately impose values on people. Therefore, for me, the crucial arguments are around the protections of those who disagree with same-sex marriage, be they denominations, celebrants, public sector or other workers. Now, we do have assurances from both the Scottish and Westminster governments that all is safe and full protection is in place. However, there remain a number of concerns. The Equality Act 2010 does not say that all protected characteristics are equal, nor does it say how conflicts between different characteristics are to be decided. As a result, the courts have to decide which rights are most important, and the perception amongst many religious people is that religion and belief often comes at the bottom of the pile. Secondly, the European Court of Human Rights can trump the UK and Scottish governments. We heard at committee that ECHR will not get involved if there is no such thing as same-sex marriage. But once same-sex marriage is permitted, will it then switch to being compulsory for churches and others to take part? If the churches are considered to be providing a public service, then the courts could act against them for only providing that service to some and not to others. Effectively, that is what happened with adoption agencies at the time when adoption uh, by same-sex couples was permitted, there were well-meaning assurances given that no agency would be forced to take part. However, we now have the situation where Oscar is stating that an agency cannot be a charity if it refuses to take part. So will permission turn to compulsion in a few years' time? That is the concern of many of us. Now, we looked at this issue in committee and got different legal views as to what might happen in future. You might have seen in the Equality Network's briefing that Karen Monaghan QC said it was inconceivable that the European Court would overturn the 
protections. But that was only one half of the story. The other half is what Aidan O'Neill said. He said, however, if marriage is extended to same-sex couples, it will become a human rights requirement that there, there be equal, equality of treatment and regard. In a sense, that is what is important about the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill. It shifts the position in that regard. And he goes on to say later, therefore, I think that the Equality Act 2010 leaves open the possibility of conflict. So not for the first time we get a variety of legal opinion from a variety of legal experts. And there is doubt whether the protections in place are robust, and there certainly are no guarantees. In a similarly controversial area, namely abortion, there is specific provision for NHS workers to be able to choose whether to take part or not take part. And that seems to me like a reasonable compromise. The NHS as a whole provides the service, but individuals are given reasonable accommodation. If this bill is to go forward, I would like to see similar increased protection for individual conscience and belief of public sector and, in fact, other workers. So, in conclusion, I do not seek to impose Christian values on what is an increasingly secular society. Neither do I seek to restrict the rights of anyone in society. I do seek equality for each person in society, but I remain unconvinced by the assurances given, and therefore I will vote against the bill. Many thanks. I now call Elaine Smith to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you. A week passed on Saturday as the constituency member for Coatbridge and Creston. I hosted the Conforti Institute's Intercultural Dialogue Conference here, which included delegates from home and abroad, gay, straight, Catholics, humanists, Protestants and pagans. And they all recognised that we have to share this planet for the short time we're here. And whilst we may not all agree on issues like same-sex marriage, we can surely disagree in a respectful fashion. Indeed, Alex Neil also asked that the debate be conducted in a good spirit and civilised manner with respect on all sides. However, since indicating that I did not intend to support the redefinition of marriage, my religion has been disparaged, I have been branded homophobic and bigoted, I have been likened to the Ku, the Ku Klux Klan, and it was suggested that I be burnt at the stake as a witch. The irony, presiding officer, is that I spent 12 years serving on the Equal Opportunities Committee when we were removing Section 2A, permitting same-sex adoption and introducing civil partnerships. And no one accused me of homophobia then. Quite the opposite. Most of the people who have engaged with me on this issue are not homophobic. They have got sincerely held beliefs that marriage means one man, one woman, as the social construct forming the basis of family life. And by altering this reality, the state will fundamentally affect our society with as yet unknown consequences. Catholics and other Christians who believe marriage is a sacrament cannot support the redefinition. And of the 77,000 respondents to the government's consultation, the biggest response ever, 67 per cent, were against redefining marriage. And these people need a vo uh, voice in here tonight. As we've heard, amendments to the Equality Act will be sought to try to protect the clergy from legal action, which clearly recognises that court cases are likely. But these protections should be for everyone. Freedom of worship and freedom of religion are two different things, and both need to be protected. And Section 14 of the Bill could be amended to give wider protection, but I'm not convinced that would be unassailable. In evidence, Alex Neil himself said sometimes it depends on the judge. Previously, we were given promises by ministers that they did not foresee unintended consequences of same-sex adoption and that Catholic adoption agencies specifically would be able to continue their work. I was in this chamber and I voted for it on that basis. We know that isn't the case. And closure now means that many children will suffer as a consequence. The problem with the threat of legal challenges is that the churches cannot afford to fight them, even if they ultimately win. So both the Catholic Church and the Church of Scotland have stated that they may be forced to separate religious ceremonies from state ceremonies. The consequence of that would be that thousands of heterosexual couples would need to get married in a registry office, then seek a religious blessing, so that a few same-sex couples would have the full ceremony in a church. Now, those that support the bill and think it will have no impact on them, or most of us that just want to live and let live, need to understand that they themselves have not time. They themselves may be directly affected. There are also wider implications and consequences, both intended and unintended. Aidan O'Neill QC's legal opinion says that parents with children in faith schools could be affected and teachers, chaplains, registrars and other public sector workers may be subject to disciplinary action. Now, despite government promises, no additional measures have as yet been included to safeguard freedom of speech and religion. The Lord Advocate's guidance to prosecutors for those who oppose same-sex marriage also gives cause for concern and suggests the expectation of legal challenges. 
Presiding officer, as a constituency MSP for Coatbridge and Christen, I have been approached by hundreds of constituents who have asked me to vote against the bill, either individually or as part of numerous local religious organisations. And there do not seem to be many members tonight who will speak against. But MSPs have a responsibility to ensure to the best of their ability that they are not introducing legislation with consequences, albeit perhaps unintended, that will negatively impact on society. Some may believe that by signing a pledge they must support the bill. Indeed, the Equality Network director worryingly claimed in Holyrood magazine a few weeks ago, over two-thirds of MSPs have now signed the Equality Network's Equal Marriage Pledge, committing them to voting in favour of same-sex marriage. I think it is important to clarify that signing a pledge and voting for legislation are two very different things. Members signed that pledge before they set eyes on the legislation or before they scrutinised the proposal. This bill may well have detrimental consequences for many people and their representatives need to know uh, to be clear about that when voting. Turning briefly to the committee report, it deals with the oral evidence, but it seems very silent on the vast amounts of written evidence, including my own. And in my submission, I cited Professor Tom Gallagher, a gay man living with his partner of 31 years and author of Divided Scotland. He hoped to give oral evidence, but he was not called, and he would like his remarks put on the record. So I quote, The arrival of gay marriage only benefits a small group of activists who have the ear of part of the media, the civil service, and of politicians who naively think there are a few votes in it for them. Some gays and lesbians feel they have been hijacked by these campaigners. Many more are bound to be upset by the hurt caused to unbigoted fellow citizens as they see one of mankind's most important social structures, marriage, become a battleground in schools and almost certainly the courts. This is no liberation for gay Scots. Members, in Instead, last it minute. creates unnecessary distrust between them and a large swathe of the population. In conclusion, my considered view is that whilst attempting to tackle a perceived inequality, we will create the conditions for discrimination and legal action against many of our citizens. And perhaps striving for an enlightened position that makes everything for the best in the best of all possible worlds, this bill will bring with it consequences which will have a detrimental impact on our fragile society. I hope that MSPs have not been bounced into voting yes because of the fear of being branded homophobic, because they signed a pledge, or because they have not reflected on all of the arguments presented to the Government and the Committee. I have no doubt the majority of MSPs George, who close, vote please. for this legislation will do so with good intentions. But unfortunately, as Karl Marx pointed out in Capital, with regard to unforeseen consequences, the way to hell is paved with good intentions. I will be voting no this evening. Many thanks. Now, Colin Kevin Stewart to be followed by Jim Hume. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And first of all, I would like to thank all of those folks who took the time to write to me uh, and let me know their views on this issue. Um, my constituents, by an overwhelming majority, uh, the ones who have co corresponded with me, have said that I should vote uh, yes uh, to this uh, bill today. Um, President Officer, I'd, I'd like to, to read part of an email which I, I received. Um, and it, it says, as a gay teenager, I cannot state strongly enough the impact that marriage equality would have on me personally and on the wider community. The majority of the political spectrum in Scotland stand by the principle of equality. I ask only that you adhere to it now. I have to say, presiding officer, that that email made me think of my own teenage years. I became a teenager uh, the year after uh, homosexuality was de decriminalised in Scotland. Um, I was a teenager at the time of Section 28, uh, and I was a teenager uh, at the time that some horrendous things were said about HIV, the gay plague. I have to say um, that society seemed to me to be hostile towards gay people. And at that point, I decided to play it straight, or at least tried to. And I have to say that I denied my own sexual orientation throughout my teens uh, and through most of my 20s, uh, and only actually told some of my close friends at the tail end of my 20s that I was gay. I didn't tell my parents that until I was 39, which is something that I really regret and feel a bit guilty about, because I kind of slighted them because their reaction was the same as it had always been in life, unequivocal love. I believe um, in traditional marriage, 
I think traditional marriage has served uh, me well in terms of the parents that I have, in terms of the grandparents that I have uh, and had, uh, and in terms of my brother and sister. It has served people so well that I believe that it should be extended to all people. I think that that is only right. I have to say, um, in terms of um, religious tolerance, I have great respect for all views. Uh, and, you know, I can understand why some folk have taken the stance that they have done. However, uh, Mr. Mason talked about religious folk feeling marginalised. I think that we have got to take account of folk who have felt marginalised for oh so many years and actually get this right here today. I have absolutely no malice, um, presiding officer, for those who intend to vote no or to abstain today. But I would urge you, really urge you, to think of your children, of your grandchildren, who may well turn out to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Give them the right to share the happiness and the love and the trials and the tribulations of marriage. Please, I would urge you to support the bill today. Many thanks. Now call on Jim Hume to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. This is one of those historic days, not just for this Parliament, but I believe for Scotland as a whole. The past years have seen a massive change in the perception of same-sex couples. It's been legal for some years now to be openly gay, uh, whereas in previous generations you were at risk of persecution and conviction. You can now serve openly in the armed forces, and of course we're proud of all who are brave enough to do so to keep us safe at home. And of course same-sex couples can now adopt and have the joy and the responsibilities that that does bring. This is not just another bill today, it's a reform in it within our society, a demonstration that our Scottish society values everyone, no matter their sexuality and, of course, no matter their relationships. I won't argue that all of Scotland or even all of this Parliament believes that we should allow same-sex marriages, but, of course, I believe that Scotland is changing. In 2002, 41% of the Scottish people agreed that same-sex couples should be allowed to marry. Just eight years later, that had risen to 61%. And, of course, when the Equal Ops Committee called for evidence, 1,300 respondents, 75% of them were positive to equal marriage. A clear majority and a clear growing support for equal marriage. And if my own bulging inbox is anything to go by, the majority by far are, are in favour of equal marriage. Not unanimously, of course, but quite clearly. It may not be much of a surprise that as Liberal Democrats we shall be supporting the progress of this bill through Parliament. It's our party policy and, and even our constitution states that we, and I quote, exist to build a safeguard, a fair, free and open society in which we seek to balance the fundamental values of liberty, equality and community and in which no one shall be enslaved by poverty, ignorance or conformity. We made our equal, party, our equal marriage our party policy in 2010 and were, I believe, the first major party to do so. We've also inputted a positive response to the consultation, which clearly states that we believe that Scotland can prove to the world that it is one of the fairest and equal places to live. I believe that the progress we have made regarding legalised being gay, serving in the forces, etc., makes it more difficult now for us to have the situation that where there is a willing religious body and two people with religious beliefs that feel strong enough that they want their relationship bonded with the sanctity of marriage, that there should be no barrier for that to happen. I do emphasise willing religious body, and I do mean willing, and I know that there are concerns that religious bodies of whichever de denomination may be forced through human rights issues to marry people that they don't want to, but I simply don't buy that. I'm aware of churches that in the past would not marry couples unless they were regular attenders or through whatever reason chose not to marry that opposite sex couple. I don't know of any case resulting in that couple taking a church to court. They simply went to a church that would be happy enough to sanctify their relationship in marriage. I can't envisage a same-sex couple also 
having any joy in taking religious bodies to court on human rights issues. And it be, may be worth noting that the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Equality Human Rights Commission are actual supporters of this bill. The bill is clear that no religious body would be required to solemnise uh, same-sex marriage and individual celebrants, even if the religious body have opted in, would have no obligation to marry a same-sex couple. We believe in a freedom of expression and that freedom of expression extends to those religious bodies who either want to opt in or out of equal marriage. Presiding officer, I have mentioned the Liberal Democrats' support for liberty, fairness and equality and that we shall support the progress of this bill. And it may be worth noting that some of the work happening elsewhere in the UK where the Protections of Freedom Act of 2012 has meant the deletion of a so-called Homosexual Act as a previous conviction, a change to allow gay men to give blood, an end to deporting, deporting uh, gay asylum seekers to countries that will torture them for the way they are, and even through the UK's government's sports charter, a call to sporting organisations to sign up to a charter to end homo homophobia and transphobia, not to mention the progress of their equal marriage bill. So I'm sure the members in this parliament will, of course, applaud Lib Dems, at least some of them anyway, in the coalition making a positive difference to equal rights for all. Presiding officer, I'm proud to be a member of the Scottish Parliament at this time of the progress of this bill. Albeit we are not the first in Europe to legislate for equal marriage, as Westminster is ahead of us, Belgium, France, Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, Spain and Iceland have already legislated, not to mention 16 of the 50 states of the United States of America. But I believe it's once again proof that if this bill progresses today, that Scotland is a fairer and more equal country and one that we can all be proud to live in. Many thanks. Now I call on John McAlpine to be followed by Alex Johnson. Up to six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will be voting for the bill because I believe it's underpinned by tolerance, recognition and respect. It's about the right to love, the fundamental human right to love, and to express that love publicly in a declaration of commitment that cannot be dismissed as second class or second best. This bill is a mark of how far we have come in a relatively short period of time uh, on the issue of equality. It's only a few decades ago within my own lifetime that homosexuality was itself criminalised, where people lived double lives, lived in fear of exposure, blackmail and sometimes even imprisonment. We should never forget that such hazards remain very real in other countries where human rights are denied on the basis of sexuality and often gender too. The language used by a small number of people outside this chamber in the wider debate on equal marriage has occasionally become polarised. We have heard the preposterous allegation that gay unions are, quote, tainted. Similarly, we have seen those who have asked for reassurances on religious beliefs uh, dismissed as homophobic. And I don't think that language is helpful. And I don't think it reflects where the majority of population stand on this issue. I support equal marriage in principle, but one of my reasons for speaking in this debate is personal. Like many people of my generation, when I was growing up in a, a very religious family, a Roman Catholic family in a small Scottish town, I didn't know anyone who was gay. Uh, my first encounter with um, homosexuality was 1975, the Thames television broadcast The Naked Civil Servant in which John Hurt portrays Quentin Crisp. And while it was a breakthrough in the sense of being a sympathetic film, it also gave a very stereotyped, almost caricaturish, caricaturish portrayal of homosexuality as outrageous and eccentric, something outside the mainstream. Yet within a few years of that film, everything had changed. Suddenly we all knew someone in our own family, our wider circle of friends who was openly gay. In my own case, my cousin and close childhood friend, Cal, came out at the age of 18. And through him, I formed many firm friendships with gay men in particular uh, that lasted a lifetime. It's perhaps not surprising, given my age and liberal outlook, that I was happy to accept my friend's sexuality. What's more significant is that the older people in our family, who had very strong religious beliefs, who grew up in a far more socially conservative age in the 50s and 60s, they also accepted my friend's sexuality. I'm not saying that it happened overnight or that there was no awkwardness or that there weren't aunties whispering in private, I just wish you'd meet a nice girl. But there was public acceptance. There were joint invitations and Christmas cards and family gatherings. And over time, as in many, many families, having a gay couple was utterly unremarkable. It was mainstream. 
When my cousin Cal died of cancer at the age of 53 years ago, we grieved as a family and his male partner was treated with the same consideration and sympathy as any heterosexual partner who had suffered such a loss. And they saw the devoted nursing care he gave to Cal in his last weeks. At the funeral, he was his chief, the chief mourner. And that's not to say that the older members of the family um, in their 70s, 80s and, and 90s had completely had abandoned in any way their strong religious beliefs. But just as they said a silent prayer at the humanist funeral, they had reached an accommodation uh, with the partnership, uh, an accommodation based on love, loyalty and basic human decency. That is why I believe that those harsh voices speaking out against this legislation are not typical of lay members of the Christian church-going population. The vast majority of religiously, religiously observant people, even those in churches which are officially against equal marriage, will accept this change in practice, just as they've accepted their gay friends and family members. They judge people on the basis of their character, not their sexuality. They ask, are they kind? Are they loyal? Are they generous? Are they fair? Are they a good son or daughter? This is what matters to most of us. I welcome the fact that the Equality Act of 2010 will be amended to further protect individual celebrants who do not wish to carry out same-sex marriage, but who belong to a religious body who has opted to do so. This is about tolerance, just as I don't believe that those with religious views opposing equal marriage should dictate the law, neither do I believe that the law should impose my values on religious denominations. I just wanted to conclude by uh, reflecting on uh, something that Margaret McCulloch uh, said um, when she was speaking for the committee, and she said that the committee had agreed to differ. Going forward, I think society as a whole uh, will agree to differ, and in doing so, they are agreeing to respect difference, difference in sexuality, and I think that's a mark of our tolerance. And I think what this piece of legislation is about is about the journey we've made as a society. And certainly, although we have heard a lot today about marginalisation and alienation and, and people feeling bullied and excluded, my personal experience is that, that this bill will bring the law into line with real life and real families. And we're actually a much more tolerant society than sometimes this debate has given the impression that we are. Thanks very much. Many thanks. Now call on Alex Johnson to be followed by Nigel Don. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. There are many of my colleagues here today whom I have heard ask the question why they got involved in politics. And the most common answer is that they got involved in politics because they wanted to change the world. Well, my most usual answer is that I got involved in politics because I thought the world was changing too fast and I wanted to slow it down a bit. Perhaps with a small c, that's the definition of conservative. When I look at the proposals contained within this bill, uh, I see some specific issues, which I hope to have time to address uh, later, but I see a general principle. And that general principle uh, is to change the way we look at marriage and to extend that to a, a greater range, a more complete range of people uh, within our uh, society. Now, that is a principle which, at heart, I believe is sound. However, my problem is with the effect this has on the overall balance of our views on marriage and with why we have chosen to act in this way at this time to the exclusion of other possibilities. Because I see marriage as an important cornerstone of our families and of our society as a whole. During my lifetime, I have seen society begin to fall apart. I have seen families uh, in instability and I have seen individual children uh, raised in difficult circumstances as a result. That's why I would argue that one of the priorities of this parliament should be to strengthen families, to find ways to reinforce marriage and to make sure that we reverse the trends of half a century and more in order to gain that stability. That's why I worry that we are making this a wrong priority at the wrong time. I have to say that during the conduct of the inquiry, the committee, uh, its members, and all of those who came before it have treated this whole issue with a very high degree of mutual respect and maturity. I believe the evidence that was given in the debate that took place was of the highest standard, and I commend the report that the committee 
produced. However, during its preparation and while we were taking evidence, there were one or two issues which I found that I had to dispute. We had Prof Professor Curtis before us talking about the level of public support. And true enough, it is the case that opinion polls indicate that support for this change uh, is growing rapidly in society. But I also believe that similar polls indicate that this is largely because people no longer have the, the care to commit to a particular policy. And it may not be that people care more, it may be that people actually care less. We've spoken about the, the redefinition of marriage and other speakers have mentioned traditional marriage as a key element uh, of what we've discussed. I do believe that traditional marriage can be undermined by this change and as a result I will ask that the Minister might say something either during this debate or before stage two on the other proposals that he has brought forward, such as the forthcoming uh, review of same-sex civil partnerships, and ask him if there is any way that during that process he can consider how we might actually lend a hand to those within, stable, within families who require support to enjoy greater stability. Elaine Smith raised the issue of tolerance. Uh, she was concerned that once she had made her public opinion uh, or made her opinion public that she suffered as, as a result. I have found that there is an extent within this broader argument where that can happen. Uh, I've had some interesting emails. But I think that's just a measure of the passion that people hold within this debate. And I think we need to promote tolerance uh, through this debate and ensure that it doesn't become a one-way street. I think it's important that that tolerance continues. There is a requirement to ensure that we protect the freedom uh, of those who disagree uh, with the change in legislation, whether they are religious bodies or whether they are staff within our public bodies and particularly teachers in our schools. I have a worry that we may, if we get this wrong, create a, a, a situation which can have certain parallels to the Section 28 debate, which resulted in some very difficult circumstances uh, for both teachers, parents and pupils in the past. We, we must make sure that this does not... Members, in his last minute, I'm afraid. Once again, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm coming to a conclusion. There are also a number of proposed amendments to this bill, which, while I will not support the bill as a whole, uh, I am prepared to support. I am concerned, however, at the proposals to lower the age at which the gender recognition process can begin, uh, and will look for further information, and am most likely to oppose any uh, change in the government's policy on that. Should we draw into a close, By, please? In closing, can I say that I understand the arguments for equality and diversity that are contained in and around this bill. Uh, I seek to ensure that we also achieve stability and security within our families and within our society. And by broadening the You're perspective closing, of this bill, there is so much more the government could achieve. Many thanks. Now call on Nigel Don to be followed by Drew Smith. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'm grateful to the Equal Opportunities Committee for its careful consideration of the bill and the report that they've brought before us. Because, of course, for those of us who are not on the committee, it's only when we get the Stage 1 report that we actually get a sense of the issues which have generated discussion and the areas of detail which need to be addressed. Of course, the committee heard a great deal of evidence that those who uh, are same-sex couples feel they are discriminated against. And I think we've had that very well and very movingly articulated by members this evening. And I think that has to be respected, and I do. Let me take a slightly different tack, if members will bear with me, than has come before, uh, and see where it takes us. What is being proposed, it seems to me, is not very different from a civil partnership. Present differences between civil partnerships and marriages are helpfully outlined at paragraph 214, and they're essentially about pension rights and international recognition. But revising the law on marriage is not the only way of dealing with this. Pension rights are, of course, reserved and can only be worked through in cooperation with the Westminster government. It's clear a significant amount of work needs to be done to resolve this. The issue of international recognition is important, 
But I simply point out that a couple in a civil partnership who wish to move abroad ought to be in a position to marry there where that, marry there where that desirable. And I'm not convinced that it's our duty to accommodate every nuance of other jurisdictions' law in our own. Forgive me if I may make some progress. I can come back if I can. Traditional view of marriage has been around for millennia and has worked rather well as the basis of family relationships within societies around the world. Now, within the Christian faith, it's not just a practical policy, but also hugely symbolic, and I want members to understand this. Jesus' death and resurrection are central to the Almighty's redemptive purpose for his people. The church, that is his people, is described as the bride of Christ many times in the Bible. Now, the differences between the two parties could hardly be clearer. Equally, their complementarity is evident from the fact that it is those very people, the Christian church, who demonstrate the outworking of Christ's love to each generation. Now, that is why the so-called traditional view of marriage does actually matter to the Christian church. Some will say it's only a word, and yes, they will be right, but words have a meaning. And I'm not in a hurry to change the meaning of a word in our law when it has so much attached to it in literature and liturgy. Now, much of the evidence relates to protections for those who do not want to have to celebrate same-sex marriages. I hope members will understand that what I've said, that such views can be held without any feelings of homophobia. Concern has also, of course, been expressed about the position of teachers. I note, firstly, that there's a general belief among witnesses that the proposed protections are strong, but secondly, that doubts remain about the robustness of these, particularly in the context of European law and the way in which that may develop over time. What is clear is that if this bill is enacted substantially as drafted, then the meaning of marriage will have been radically altered. The Cabinet Secretary says that he will not regard his marriage as having been diminished by what is proposed. I understand his view and have a similar view about my relationship with my wife. But I remind members that a set is not defined by its present population, but by its boundaries. Let me get to the end, please. What we are proposing, um, what is being proposed to change marriage as an institution, and that alters the context for everyone in the future. As Mr. Spock would have put it, it's marriage, Jim, but not marriage as we know it. Joe. Thank, thank the member for taking intervention. Um, while well, absolutely respecting the rights of everyone of, of religion to, to hold their, their views, I, I wonder if the member could acknowledge that the current legislation, the law right now, discriminates against me and other LGBT people in Scotland. Nigel Don. I would prefer to acknowledge that it distinguishes, Sim yeah, simply because a heterosexual relationship and a homosexual relationship are dealt with differently. Now, as I'd hoped what would have, the member would have picked up was it seems to me that those differences are ones which we should address. Those pension rights should be dealt with. That international recognition should be dealt with. My concern is that we do have this one word, and I hope from what I've said previously, and I will, I will encourage people to go back and read it on the record, there are, re there are reasons for being concerned simply about that word. Well, I, 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 Patrick... I'm, to Harvey. Yes, I'm, grateful, I'm grateful to the member. It's interesting that he seems to place great emphasis on the importance of the value of that word in relation to his own marriage. But in discussing the, the merits of civil partnership, it's not an essential difference he, he talks about, but a technical one. Why should those of us who place value in that word and have a cultural meaning relevant to our own lives not also enjoy the freedom to express it? Nigel Dawn, one minute. I'm absolutely clear, I'm going to be running out of time on all the rest, aren't I? I'm absolutely clear that they can, and I think they will. What I'm asking members to understand is that there are reasons why, within a biblical theology, people within the Christian church feel that that word has another meaning. That's all. And that is historically where it's been. Members in his last minute. Okay. Um, finally, presiding officer, gosh, this is going to have to be shortened. I note that... The future of civil partnerships are already under review. I'm just wondering why we're in such a hurry to change the meaning of marriage at the moment when many of the issues, which, some of which we picked up in a Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, could be much more easily dealt with had we rationalised civil partnerships across same-sex and opposite-sex relationships. And I think I would encourage the Minister to consider whether or not it might be better to get that first before we actually implement this, because I think it might have reduced some of the problems. I'm out of time. Done. Thanks.
Uh, sadly, we now have to move to five minute speeches, and I call on Drew Smith to be followed by Christian Allard. Thank you very much, President Officer. In coming here, members uh, bring with us a range of experiences, ideas, and beliefs, but it, I think it is always worth reminding ourselves that our debates and judgments, although they might not always seem to, do affect real people, how they live their lives, the opportunities that they have, and their sense of the value which society places upon them. Equal marriage rights were raised with me during the 2011 campaign, and I strongly supported the references which were included in my own party's manifesto. But I had um, perhaps not thought through the reasons why I felt the way I did about it, and perhaps thought that my response was instinctual. And then after the election, I was first asked my views a few days later, and over time been, I found myself being asked about it uh, more and more often. And as I, I tried to think about that and listen to others expressing their view, I came to understand the thoughts and feelings about this a little bit more clearly. In the course of that, of that wider debate we've had up to the introduction of this bill, I also remembered someone um, who I hadn't forgotten, but I perhaps didn't realise the extent to which they had um, influenced the view that I thought um, was instinctual. Like the majority of the Scottish population, I strongly support the provisions of this bill, and I have at various times pressed the Cabinet Secretary and indeed his predecessor to, to hurry along, so I am very pleased um, that we have got to this point, and I hope that we will now follow England and Wales and some of the many other countries um, that have been identified in, in creating equal marriage. I believe that marriage rights is an issue of, of equality, and I feel strongly that the current position of um, civil partnerships, which I supported at the time and I was proud of my, my party's leader in introducing them, um, to be not quite um, enough. And I, I've heard it said that there is, there is you know, little distinction between, a little difference between civil partnerships and, and marriage in terms of of legal rights, but just in one aspect of it, for civil partnerships to preclude the right of gay people of faith um, to commit themselves to each other in a religious service, um, that is discriminatory. Um, and that is one of the major achievements which I hope this legislation um, will remove. Same-sex relationships, or, 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 officer, equality to me um, doesn't mean that everything must be the same, but equally, difference should not be imposed upon identical things. Same-sex relationships may be different from opposite-sex relationships, but then aren't all relationships different and unique? Don't they though, also share the same basic principle? Love for another human being and a desire to commit to spending your life with that person. I don't believe that's, that is the right for the state to draw a distinction between human partnerships that human beings do not draw themselves. And to me, that is fundamentally what this bill is about and why I support it. In 2000, this parliament repealed Section 28, Clause 2A, uh, something which it did in advance to the rest of the UK. And looking back, repeal of Section 28 was a victory for, for equality, but it didn't come without a cost. Just as the years of various discriminatory laws did not come without cost, and just as that cost exists in many parts of the world still, as Joe McAlpine very rightly highlighted. And there are members in this chamber who would have celebrated that victory then, and they might also recall some of the pain of that debate. The things which were said which can never be unsaid, the people who pushed ahead and, in my view, have never been properly recognised for their efforts. Because when Section 28 was debated by this Parliament, I was still at school and it was a religious school. And I recall what was said. I recall talking to classmates about the leaflets that were going through our parents' doors, the newspaper headlines and the things that were said on the school bus. And I mentioned that I, I, thought of, I thought of someone in the, the context of this debate, and I, I remember um, an individual, a, a girl in a year at school, a young woman, who one evening appeared um, on the TV news, which was rather unexpected. And she spoke out, and to many of us, she became the first person we knew to come out. And she did it by asking a very simple and powerful question. What right do other people have to make a judgment about who I am, my life, to make a distinction about who and what I am? And that was in the context um, of, that, of that Section 28 debate. And there are many things that could be said about this bill, and, and other people um, are rightly saying them. But I celebrate the fact that this may be the last major legal change required to remove discrimination from our law for lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. And I'm very privileged to be in this place at this time to support it. I'll follow the amendments at Stage 2, and I'll also support the efforts to further improve this bill, because for transgender people, um, it probably isn't the last major piece of legislation, but it is a very significant step on the way. And I would also say, presiding officer, that I would um, seek to oppose any change um, to the bill, which, uh, if, if I believe that it could threaten a new Section 20, however well-intentioned um, some of the, uh, some, some, uh, all of the people around that issue um, may be, because I don't want to have a situation where uh, there is another campaign to come back to this piece of legislation because of a clause that is inserted 
um, at stage two. I don't know, President Officer, if that woman that I mentioned um, has sent one of us an email asking us to support this legislation um, or not, if she's put her, her uh, activism close, behind her. But um, for her as much as for many of the other good reasons, and I thank Ruth Davidson for giving a, a voice to that view today, um, it's thanks to her and many people that I've met in this, course of this campaign that a generation of people can grow up, fall in love and get married, not without the world caring who you get married to, but with the world recognising um, the partnership that you make rather than differentiating your relationship. And I'm very grateful to support the general principles of this bill. Many thanks. Again, my apologies, but we have to cut the debate back to five minutes speeches. Christian Allard, followed by Patrick Harvey. Up to five minutes, please. President Officer, I'd like to thank, first of all, Mary Fees, the convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee, who welcomed me to the committee when we first considered the bill. And, of course, I, a few months later, welcome Margaret McClock as our new convener. President Officer, before I come to the details of the recommendation we made in this report, I would like to thank all the members of the Equal Opportunities Committee for their warm welcome and for the way our group worked together on this bill, echoing Alex Johnston and John Mason's words early on, that we agreed to, the, to disagree and we moved forward. On registration, registration of celebrants, we made a couple of accommodations. The first one came from the evidence of our friend Borowski of the Scottish Council of Jewish Com Communities. Uh, he addressed the definition of non-civil marriages, particularly in the context of humanist marriages, we feel it is important to reflect the distinction between religious ceremonies and belief ceremonies. This is why we asked the Scottish Government views on a suggested amendment to the redefinition of non-civil marriages. Next, Ross Wright of the Humanist Society Scotland gave evidence and commented on the Church of Scotland's preferential status in law. Um, we are asking the Government to clarify his view on the claim that the Church of Scotland has a privileged status in marriage law. On the future of civil partnerships, a lot of what said about the government's forthcoming review, and we heard the Cabinet Secretary today reassuring us that uh, uh, this review will come, through, will come through. We particularly note the Scottish Government plans to consider issues relating to reform of civil partnerships, including opposite-sex civil partnerships. To understand better the reason behind the bills, we bit, did a fair bit of travelling when taking evidence. Believe me, the international perspective was always there. With this bill, same-sex couples who have entered into a civil partnership in another country will have to dissolve their partnership before being permitted to marry here in Scotland. We feel as a committee that these couples should be able to convert their civil partnership to a marriage, just like couples whose civil partnerships were conducted in Scotland. Another view from the Scottish Government is that allowing gender-neutral ceremonies could cause problems for denominations that might not want to use a gender-neutral marriage declaration when marrying an opposite-sex couple. We kind of disagree. We would like the Government to reconsider. It should be possible to allow a choice of gender-neutral and gender-specific language for marriage declarations. Professor John Curtis told us how much public opinion changed regarding attitudes towards same-sex relationships. I am pleased that a lot of our work was to recognize the change of gender for married persons or civil partners. As I feel, attitudes towards transgender communities have not changed as yet as much as I would like. James Morton of the Scottish Transgender Alliance told us about his proposal for an amendment to the bill to make sure that a spouse cannot stop his or her partner's gender recognition. James said that for someone to have a gender identity legally recognized and respected by the government is a human right, something that no one should be able to stop. We considered how spouses of people seeking gender recognition may find the process very difficult. An important point is that we have not received any evidence from their perspective. After long considerations, we came to the conclusion that the non-transition spouse's personal choice is sufficiently protected by the automatic grounds for divorce triggered by his or her partner seeking gender recognition. We are asking in the report for the requirement for spouse consent for gender recognition to be removed. We received evidence about lowering the age requirement to change gender. Jess Morton again said that transgender people aged 16 or 17 will remain discriminated discriminated against under the bill as drafted. Uh, we really don't think we have enough evidence again on lowering the age requirement. 
is the reason we asked the government to provide uh, in advance of stage to a detailed response on the issue. To conclude, President Officer, I would like to share a thought about how the world has moved on. As you must know by now, I was raised on a chicken farm in Burgundy, in France. I truly remember the day my father told me about one of his regular customers, a farmer who lived in a remote village with his partner. I was really struck the way my father spoke about this couple, with great respect and in a friendly tone. And I might disagree with Ellen Smith uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, she talked about a small group of activists, and I will not consider this couple uh, deep in rural Scotland a small group of close, activists. Please. I wonder what happened to them, but I, w I wonder today how much those two farmers, those two men, would have liked to get married like every other farming couple in rural France many decades ago. Yes. Now, Colin Patrick Harvey to be followed by Jim Eady. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, for the privilege of taking part in this debate. And I'd also like to thank uh, several of the speakers who've given a very personal take on the issue, Kevin Stewart, Mark Biaggi, and Ruth Davison in particular. In 10 years as a member of this parliament, I have never so enthusiastically applauded a Conservative speech. Um, <laughs> always open to a new experience, of course. <laughs> members, um, members might be... As a little surprise, I think, that my own personal circumstances place me in what I regard as impeccably neutral territory on this issue. I'm single. I'm bisexual. I've no idea whether I'll have a, a long-term relationship with a man or a woman in the future, and I've no idea whether I would want to get married. I, I certainly don't personally regard it as a gold standard, but as one of the many choices about family status, that people will make a, a choice between on, their, on terms of their own values, not on terms of the values that we would impose upon them. Some of the arguments that I've heard against this legislation have been, well, they've been many and varied. There have been some which are frankly spurious and silly, such as the, well, you know, you can get married already just to somebody of the opposite sex. I, I can't believe how frequently I've heard this, this nonsensical and demeaning argument. Some have been mischievous. There have been, I think, deliberate attempts to whip up ungrounded fears about ministers of the Church of Scotland being dragged off by the police and taken to the courts uh, and prosecuted uh, for refusing to marry same-sex couples. And some of the arguments against the legislation have simply been curious, such as the view that from the starting point of religious freedom, the law ought to tell churches who they may not be allowed to marry. It seems to me that the argument from religious freedom has to be in favour of what the government's trying to achieve with this bill, which is to permit but not compel. However, there are some arguments against this legislation which are serious and which we should not ignore. Quite the contrary. There has been serious opposition to pretty much every step in the equality story that has been taken over many, many generations. And there are certain voices who have opposed every step towards LGBT equality from decriminalisation onwards. These serious arguments absolutely should not be ignored. They should be confronted and defeated because they assert, whether they do so in religious terms or any other, they assert basically the lesser worth the lesser dignity, the lesser status, or the lesser value of LGBT people and our relationships. These arguments are serious and should be defeated. They deserve to be defeated. In over 20 years of volunteering, working, or campaigning on many of the issues in this area, I have honestly never heard a coherent moral argument uh, in favour of this view of the lesser worth, lesser status, or the in, in some ways, same-sex relationships are simply morally wrong. I've heard many such arguments which are rooted in homophobia, none which are rooted in a coherent moral case that I've, I've heard. Some of the arguments I've heard fall under the heading, I'm not homophobic, but... Such as those which amount to saying, I'm not homophobic, I'm just concerned that one day I might need to treat LGBT people as though they were my equals. And on the basis of that argument, we've heard demands for so-called protections to be built into this legislation, protections from the indignity of having to treat other people as equals. 
And if we look at the evidence that we heard on the call for these protections, what they amount to, if we were to give in to these demands, would be a rolling back of 10 or 15 years of legislative and cultural progress toward equality. We should hold the line against those demands, absolutely. Not as a, an MSP, but as a citizen. I was proud of our Parliament, of Scotland's Parliament, when it repealed Section 28, but also when it held the line against demands for concessions to the forces of conservatism and homophobia. Uh, sorry, social conservatism, I should have said, and, and homophobia. It held the line and it didn't give those concessions. We should be equally proud today and over the months to come, not only of passing this legislation, but of holding the line against those demands for amendments which would weaken the principle of equality, we should also listen seriously to the calls for amendments on issues that members have mentioned, such as the spousal veto, overseas civil partnerships, gender neutral language, and gender recognition for younger people. I believe that if we do that, we will, we will uh, it deserve the pride of many, many uh, Scottish citizens when we pass the bill at stage three. Many thanks. Now, call on Jim Eady to be followed by Elaine Murray. Up to five minutes, please. Presiding officer, the bill before us concerns an issue that is deeply close to my own heart, as it is for other members and to our fellow citizens who have joined us in the gallery this evening. Ruth Davidson was right to say that this debate is a sign of the growing maturity of this parliament. The bill is about marriage, but its passage into law will also represent the culmination of decades of struggle for equality for lesbians and gay men, as well as for bisexual and transgender people. Let us not forget that as recently in our history as 1980, homosexual relations between two men remained illegal, while the very concept of relations between two women did not exist in law. In truth, presiding officer, to be lesbian or gay in Scotland, and here I can only speak from my own experience, was to inhabit a cold and inhospitable place. To come out at that time was to face rejection from friends, from family and from work colleagues. It was also to risk opprobrium and in some cases violence. There were precious few positive role models in the media or in our communities and it seemed that the further you travelled from metropolitan Glasgow or cosmopolitan Edinburgh, the harsher and the colder that climate became. Many people felt Scotland left Scotland rather than stay and face the discrimination and prejudice which was sadly a hallmark in so much of Scottish society at that time. Thankfully, the culture and temperature has changed. To have had this debate even 10 years ago would have been unthinkable. And yet the passage of this bill will in time, I believe, enjoy widespread acceptance within our society. The challenge for those of us who make our laws is not to do what is popular, to stick our finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing, but to represent our constituents, to listen to the voice of our own conscience and to do what is right. I believe this measure is right and that it commands the support of the public. In the years since 1980, there has been much progress towards equality. Employment legislation, the armed forces ban lifted, an equal age of consent, adoption rights and the introduction by this parliament of a law to outlaw hate crime. But the struggle for equality has not yet been won. That is why this bill and this debate is so important to so many of us. The most significant change in the context of this debate is, of course, the introduction of civil partnerships, undoubtedly enhancing the lives of many same-sex couples across the country by conferring on them many of the rights enjoyed by married couples. But civil partnership is a legal contract. It is not marriage. My constituents have written in their hundreds to urge me to support this bill, and I have been moved and humbled by their testimony. One woman wrote to me to say, I am a practising Catholic who is a strong supporter of same-sex marriage and would very much want my voice to be heard. One man urged me to support the bill to end what he called government-supported prejudice against gay people as second-class Scots. Another constituent contacted me to say, I simply cannot understand what harm it does to anyone if two other people decide to get married? What possible grounds can there be to object to the legislation? Well, it cannot be freedom of religion, because the bill enshrines protection for those denominations who are opposed on grounds of theology. When asked by me at the Equal Opportunities Committee, has your denomination been compelled to perform same-sex marriage in any of the countries that have introduced same-sex marriage, the representative of the Catholic Church stated in evidence the Catholic Church has not. 
Let us be clear, no synagogue, no mosque, no temple and no church, whether of the Catholic or Reformed traditions, will be forced to conduct same-sex marriage. This bill does not undermine freedom of religion. We enhance freedom of religion by allowing those faith who recognise same-sex marriage as part of their understanding of God's love for all people to conduct those ceremonies. The objection to the bill cannot be the need to protect traditional marriage, as marriage has evolved over time. Who today would defend the subjugation of women within marriage, as expressed by Lord Justice Clark Braxfield in the 18th century, when he said in law, a wife has no person? Traditional marriage has evolved to recognise the rights of women, to allow divorce, and has always evolved to reflect social mores. The objection to the bill cannot be because it represents an attack on marriage. On the contrary, how can it when it will meet the desire by thousands of loving couples to be brought within its ambit, contrary to what Alec Johnson said in his contribution? This bill will strengthen marriage. Presiding officer, Scotland is no longer that cold and inhospitable place. Tonight, we have the opportunity to take a further significant step as a society to recognise that love is love whether it be a man and a woman, a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. The bill offers a Would state and social close, affirmation of the right of two people who love one another to proclaim that love before the world. This is a wonderful opportunity for this parliament to signal to the world the type of country we want Scotland to be, one that is open, tolerant and generous to all. Presiding officer, the time for equality in Scotland has arrived. Close, the time for marriage equality is now. Many thanks. Now call on Dr Elaine Murray to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Up to five minutes, please. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I am pleased to take the opportunity to, to speak in the Stage 1 debate on the Marriage and Civil Partnerships Bill. I am not a member of the Equal Opportunities Committee, but I have been opposed to discrimination towards people on the basis of sexual orientation since I was a student, and that was about 40 years ago. And indeed, that was in that bleak and inhospitable place that Jim, uh, Jim Eady just spoke about, where sex between men was still illegal, where lesbianism wasn't recognised because apparently Queen Victoria didn't think it could happen, uh, where same-sex pa partners would dare, rarely dare to express their affection publicly. Coming out to the family was a major difficulty for many gay people, and the popular terminology used to describe gay people was derogatory and offensive, and I found all of this totally abhorrent, as I did a party and racial segregation, which also existed at the same time. Now, I've had many representations from constituents on this bill, many supportive and many opposed. Uh, to those constituents who have asked me to vote against the bill, as it redefines marriage, I apologise, but I do not agree with their, their arguments, and I will explain more. To those who told me they won't vote for me, well, I'm afraid that's their prerogative. The the view that marriage is solely the union of a man and a woman for the procreation is, I believe, outdated and simplistic. There has always been a lot more to marriage than that. For monarchs and powerful families, marriage created and cemented alliances. For others, it represented respectability and the division of labour and responsibilities between men and women. And until recently, women, as Jim Eady referred to, were the possessions of their husbands. Marriage signified that a woman belonged to that man, and so nobody else could have a sexual relationship with her, and therefore the man could be sure that the children uh, created were his. But marriage in this, these more egalitarian times is a public de declaration of love and the intention that that relationship will be permanent. It may or may not involve children. If it does, those children may or may not be the biological children of both or either of the parents. Many of us, myself included, have been married more than once. Indeed, my eldest lad was at my second marriage. Uh, and many of us, others have stable long-term relationships, bringing up their families, but without feeling the need to be married. And many families consist of one parent bringing up children with the support of relatives and friends. And the bill, this bill enables people of the same gender who want to make that public declaration of love and permanence in a religious ceremony, reflecting their faith to be able to do so. Now, I also support the government in proposing an opt-in process, and I welcome the insurances that have been given. But some of the representations I've had from constituents have uh, been very concerned about certain aspects of discrimination against people of faith. And I know that the uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, mentioned uh, circulating letters to a member. I wonder if he could circulate that around all MSPs so that we could maybe offer that reassurance to those constituents who have been in touch with us. Others have reflected how far we have come in the past 40 years. I would have not. If somebody had told me 40 years ago that a Conservative Prime Minister in the UK Parliament would be promoting equal marriage, I simply would not have believed them. 
I am proud of Scotland's journey, proud that over 60% of Scots now agree with equal marriage and three quarters of those who uh, responded to the committee's consultation did so. The books I read as a young woman uh, describing the experience of gay people, whether Radcliffe Hall's Well of Loneliness or Gore Vidal's The City and the Pillar, were stories of tragedy. Those, the story of being gay or being LGBT now should no longer be a story of tragedy. And to those who say that civil partnership should be enough, I would remind them, if they are old enough, of the 1976 hit by Tom Robertson's band, Sing If You're Glad to Be Gay which despite, despite its cheerful title spoke of police harassment, meetings and insults and ended with, and I'll, uh, I'll not say the word, that bees are legal now. What more do they want? Well, equality, like most people, equality. And I will support this bill tonight at stage one and I hope it makes its way through Parliament into legislation. It won't be the end of discrimination against LGBT people but is an expression and by this Parliament of the will to treat people equally and not to discrimination, discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or sexual identity it's at that, that someone was born with. Because when I was young people used to think being LGBT was something, maybe it was a choice or maybe it's something their mum did or their school did or so on. Actually, people are born that way. People, some, somebody who's LGBT does not make the choice to be that any more than I made the choice to grow only to five foot one. It is bus part. <laughs> Miss Murray, can I ask you to bring your remarks to a close? Of, exactly. Of the glorious diversity of human beings. Legislation should treat people equally. It should not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity any more than on gender, race or faith. And I believe the government is getting it uh, balanced right. I'm pleased to support the bill and I am so proud of the progress we have made in Scotland during my own lifetime. Linda Fabiani, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you very much, um, President Officer. The glorious diversity of human beings from Elaine, I think, just sums it up. Uh, that was absolutely great. And I'm really pleased to, to be in this debate today because I feel as if it's been a long time coming. Um, that's perhaps just a mark of my own frustration about things. And I looked back at the, the debate during the, the 2004 legislation for civil partnerships. And I, I said at that time, um, how could anyone sit here and say that it is equality if same-sex couples are not allowed to manifest their faith in the same way that mixed-sex couples can, even if the Minister of Religion is happy to carry out uh, the ceremony? And I still feel that way. I just can't get my head around the idea that some people should be treated differently from others. It's just very, very wrong. However, it may well be um, that although I saw civil partnerships as a temporary solution, um, you know, that should have been very quickly overtaken, it may well be that it was right at the time uh, and that it was right that that step was taken and then we moved on. And certainly the figures that Jackie Bailey quoted um, about how social attitudes have changed, um, perhaps do say, in fact, that was correct. I've been really struck today by the amount of um, personal testimony that's been given, and people have been very, very brave. Um, don't anybody get their notebook, notebook out. I'm not about to say anything uh, terribly, terribly stunning. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, time moves on, attitudes change, and perhaps... Um, 30 odd years ago, my standing up and saying, you know what, I'm not married, I live in sin, might have been as stunning as, as what we're hearing people uh, say in the chamber today. Now, nobody cares about that. You know, it might have been stunning to hear an 11 year old say in the 60s, I was that 11 year old, you know what, my mum's just ran off with another man and uh, they're going to get divorced, my mum and dad. I had that for a couple of years from people. Um, in school and neighbours, people I met because I was ashamed of it, because social mores at that time said it was something that was very, very shocking. So what we've done today, I think, is very, very important. It's a natural step forward. And I hope that we do get to the point where there's somebody standing up somewhere in the parliament when I'm no longer here and explaining something that has been taboo for so many years and saying, you never guess what, it's not all that long ago that same-sex marriages were something that people found it really difficult to talk about. People felt it very, very hard to say um, that I'm actually in a same-sex relationship. 
and that is what's right for me. So to me, it's just about equality. Straight, simple equality. Accept people the way that they are. Why can't everyone just accept people the way they are if they're not hurting anybody else? Really, really simple. And that brings me on to the spousal veto. I was going to talk about it more, but I'm aware there's other people want to get in. And I was pleased to hear the minister say in his opening remarks that he was going to look at the, the spousal veto uh, on legal gender recognition. Um, you know, where people have been through that whole process, but their spouse can still um, stop them by being legally recognised. That has to be looked at, Minister. I'm glad you'd say you'd do it. I'd like to end um, by saying, by paying recognition to everyone who's worked for this uh, so hard. And there, there's a great wee book, um, the Equality Network book, Reasons to Support Equal Marriage. And what, what struck me when I looked through this was how happy everybody looked. It's such a happy, happy document. And it also struck me today when we were out um, standing in the wet mud, getting our photographs taken, um, how happy everyone was that this was happening. So let's not lose that. I think we should be very, very happy that we're moving forward in such a way. Yeah, we still have a way to go. But hey, you, today's really, really good. It's really good for this parliament, for every one of us in it, I believe, in the longer term, even though some may not feel it now. But it's very, very good for Scotland, and we should celebrate that. I now call Margaret Mitchell to be followed by James Donnan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In this important debate about same sex, more often referred to as equal marriage, it is worth taking a moment to set the debate in context. The Equal Opportunities Committee is the lead committee for this bill and has a formal remit to consider and report on matters relating to equal opportunities, which includes the prevention, elimination or regulation of discrimination between persons on the grounds of, amongst others, gender, marital status, race, disability, age, sexual orientation and religion. The proposition before us today is that the belief, traditionally, if not exclusively, held by members of the Christian faith and other religions, that marriage is a relationship between a man and a woman, discriminates against same-sex couples, and therefore the law must be changed to allow equal marriage. This is a dangerous distortion of equality in an equal opportunities context, which celebrates diversity. Here, equality is not about seeking to make everyone the same, but rather it is essentially about the elimination of discrimination and concentrating on fairness and diversity. And equal marriage sets two equality strands, sexual orientation and religious belief in competition with one another. If you don't mind, my view this evening is in the minority and I want to use the time available to me to develop it in a coherent manner. The decriminalisation of homosexuality in 1980 was an important milestone in tackling the historic discrimination against LGBT people. But same-sex couples in stable and loving relationships for many years still had no legal rights vis-a-vis -vis their partners. So if one partner was hospitalised, the other had no legal right to be given any information about their illness or care because they were not deemed a relative. The 2004 Civil Partnership Act, together with the inclusion of same-sex cohabitees in the Family Law Scotland Bill, ended this terrible injustice. In doing so, provision was made for legal rights to, for example, inheritance, property ownership, etc., to be recognised for same-sex couples. The point is, presiding officer, discrimination has been addressed as described above. In seeking to go further and redefine marriage, the government is blurring the distinction between state civil provision where it has a role to play 
and the religious belief and teaching where it does not. Furthermore, people who believe passionately in the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman felt empathy with the LGB community and supported and campaigned to eliminate and discriminate against them, to eliminate the discrimination against them. They did so despite warnings and fears voiced about marriage being undermined because it was the fair and right thing to do. These same people now find that there is little reciprocal empathy and sometimes tolerance for their views. In seeking to redefine marriage, the pendulum has swung too far. Passing this legislation will do nothing to address the totally unacceptable abuse of LBGT individuals which still exists and includes, for example, instances of homosexuals within the Asian community being forced into heterosexual marriages. But if this legislation is passed, regardless of the well-intentioned proposals for safeguards, ultimately people who oppose same-sex marriage and who already feel inhibited in expressing these views will be more apprehensive about expressing their religious beliefs. In conclusion, presiding officers, there is nothing remotely fair about seeking to dismiss and diminish the deeply held convictions and religion's belief of thousands of people in Scotland who attend church, temple or mosque, work hard to do their best for their families and go about their everyday business without imposing their views on anyone else. And that's why, presiding officer, I'll be voting against this bill this evening. James Donnan, followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, presiding officer. We're all hugely influenced by our early experiences. I was very fortunate in mine. I come from a conscientious, working class, Irish Catholic family, steeped in social awareness, and I was taught from an early age that perceived difference mattered not a jot, that we were all Jock Tamsin's bairns. And this maxim has stood me in good stead over the years. And that is the reason why I will be supporting us tonight. It's not because I've had a, a, a number of emails that say I should support it. As, if anything, on balance, I've probably had more against it than for it. I'll be doing it on the basis of what I believe to be right and because of some personal experiences. This is a huge step for the Parliament. It's a huge step for Scotland. I've talked about this being a good thing for the Scottish Parliament. I think it's a good thing for the country. We pride ourselves on our equality, our fairness and our social justice, as Jackie Bailey said earlier on, and I think this is a perfect example of that. We talk about safeguards or safeguards for celebrants, both religious and belief celebrants, and we're not forcing anyone. This is about religious freedom. This allows certain religions to opt in or opt out. They don't need to do it. Nobody's forcing anyone. And I, can, I tell you, my, I have two sons who are both married. None of them are going to feel less married if my brother can get married to his partner. That's a ridiculous argument. I am a bit older than some of the earlier speakers, like uh, some of the very eloquent speeches earlier on from Ruth and Marco and, and Kevin um, amongst the, the, a huge number of them. And I remember growing up, and I remember what it was like for people who were gay growing up. The thing is, you didn't really know who they were because they were in the shadows. My brother, Michael, he was 15 when he came out, but he never came out to us. So the situation was so bad in Glasgow and in Scotland at the time that he never came out to us. He waited till he was 17, he went down to London, he started a new life, met a guy, went over to Portugal. He had to do that because that's the Scotland that we lived in at the time. And for, such, for people to be saying that we shouldn't be moving on, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. There's no losers in this. There's only winners in this. I mean, I, I, I completely understand people's different views. I completely understand if you come from a religious aspect that, that you, you may have some concerns about it. But surely... I mean, the interesting thing, Michael, uh, more religious than me, he kept his faith much longer than I did. I had lost my faith. And yet, even when he was being discriminated against by his church, he still kept his faith much longer than I did. Religion should not be a barrier to this legislation. This is highly important legislation. I mean, he, he, he created a life for himself out with his homeland. He's over there, he's had a partner now for 39 years, and I'm delighted to say, I phoned him up last night, and I says to him, Michael, guess what I'm doing? I'm going to use you in a speech in the Parliament tomorrow. <laughs> and it was like, 
again, right? So, <laughs> so he was comfortable with it. But then he told me, he told me a wee while ago that he was thinking about getting married. Him and his partner, they've been together for 39 years. It's a fairly long engagement, but they've decided that now is probably the time when they'll get married. And I suspect that some of that is that none of us are getting any younger. They're looking to make sure that everything's right for when one of them goes, etc. But it's a great thing. The unfortunate thing is, it has to do it in Lisbon. What I hope is that if any member of my family or anybody I know who's of a different generation, who's coming up, who is homosexual or you know, gay or lesbian, can do it in Scotland. And I hope, because I'll tell you, I don't know if the whip's in yet. Oh, hello, Joe. I'll speak to you instead. I'll be looking for that day off. I'll be looking to go to Lisbon to see my brother get married. But it'd be much easier if it was in Glasgow or Edinburgh. So it's a great thing. But anyway, when I was speaking to him last night, I said to him I was going to use him today in this speech. And he says to me, all oh, right, OK. He says, coincidentally, James, I'm going in tomorrow to sign the papers so that we can organise the day that the marriage gets, gets celebrated. So it's coming. It's coming soon. And it's going to be coming soon in this country. I'm confident that we'll be voting yes tonight. And I'm confident that when we get to the stage three, that this bill will become law. And I'll tell you, Scotland will be a much better place for it. Anne McTaggart, followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. And as an MSP representing a large, diverse and multicultural region of Glasgow, I believe it is part of my duty to tackle prejudice, intolerance and discriminations in all forums. Not only because prejudice impacts on the lives of those who experience it, but because it holds us back as a nation. The passing of this bill will have both a legal and symbolic significance for the LGBT people and their families, who are often on the receiving end of prejudice and discrimination. As mentioned earlier by Ruth Davidson in her eloquent speech, Recent research tells us that one in four young people who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual have seriously contemplated or attempted suicide. Presiding officer, this figure is a disgrace in modern Scotland, and I truly believe that by eliminating some of the remaining differences, we could remove the stigma that could affect so many of our young people. Access to civil partnerships, like has been mentioned earlier, was a huge commendable step forward, but it ensured that a division between same-sex and mixed-sex couples carried on into the 21st century. I believe that opening up the institution of marriage would achieve true legal equality for the first time. I recognise that equality doesn't mean that we all have to be the same, but in my view, it does mean sharing the institution of marriage with those who have suffered discrimination, oppression and persecution for centuries. I also believe that the principle of equality should be extended to heterosexual couples who would like their relationship to be recognised in a different way. I have argued that civil partnerships should be extended to mixed-sex couples who choose to celebrate their relationship in a civil or secular ceremony outside of traditional marriage. As a consequence of denying heterosexual people access to civil partnerships, we are once again segregating couple, couples based on their sexual orientation. This is outdated and something this bill should seek to remove fully from our society. Presiding officer, I do recognise that the proposal of same-sex marriage is challenging to many people of faith and to some of our religious organisations. Having Christian values myself, presiding officer, I understand the view that marriage is an institution specific to the relationship between one man and one woman. This is not a view that I personally share, but I passionately believe that those who hold it should be free to express it. That's why I am reassured to note that no religious organisations will be forced to perform same-sex marriages against their will and that religious freedoms will be protected by this bill. Presiding officer, attitudes are changing in all parliaments across the world. Greater recognition for same-sex couples are high, are high on the agenda. 
We should not be left behind on this issue, and I look forward to being part of the Parliament that brought this long overdue legislation to the people of Scotland. Thank you. Richard Lyle to be followed by John Finney. Mr Lyle, you've got four minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Can I personally thank you for the opportunity to take part in this debate today? In regards to managing a civil partnership bill, I have been contacted by a large proportion of my constituents, a majority of which are opposed to this bill. My constituent Ronnie Matheson questions why we are redefining a word which once met, meant one thing to now mean something different, marriage. He suggests that all previous literature, textbooks, records, legislation, poetry, plays, songs will have to be foot footnoted and dated with an explanation of the change of Scottish terminology. He suggests in his email to me that there's always, there already appears to be a legal challenge to watertight safeguards in the similar English bill. Will this bill be watertight? I don't think so, and many repeat that observation. Constituents such as Mrs Morris, who is concerned that people who do not support same-sex marriage will suffer in the workplace. Other constituents such as Ms Young have concerns that ministers of religion could be prosecuted for refusing to marry same-sex couples. Or the, the question asked the, the Cabinet Secretary earlier on from Anne McCool. I would ask you to look very carefully at the introduction of safeguards for people who believe in the existing definition definition of marriage, there is a danger that foster carers or adopters may be classed as unsuitable because of their opposition to same-sex marriage. The government's suggested solutions for fostering guidance is not good enough. I would be grateful if you would highlight the following concerns. That a clause be inserted in the bill that views on the uh, nature of marriage should not be considered during the approval process of foster carers and adopters that a statutory safeguard should be introduced into Children and Young People's Scotland Bill to ensure that what people think about same-sex marriage does not influence decisions on their applications to be adoptive parents. As I said earlier, 30 years ago, I was an adoptive parent, and I don't think I would have passed because of my view today. Constituents, uh, my wife's minister, no, I have no time. My wife's Minister Reverend Derek Hughes recently emailed us stating that all the, the bill stands that will place supporters of traditional marriage in conflict with equality laws. He has went on at the very least amendments need to be introduced to this bill to protect ministers, chaplains, teachers, registrars amongst others who will find themselves in an uncomfortable un situation when forced to choose between their deeply held religious views and the proposed new law. In light of this, many of my constituents feel that this section of the bill, which is meant to be designed to protect those who speak out against same-sex marriage, is not fit for purpose and should be amended to clearly specify that it is not against the law to criticise same-sex marriage. Rest assured, this bill, when passed, will be tested to the limit. Adoption will be tested. People who want to adopt will be, as I suggested earlier, questioned on their views. I would also like to remind this Parliament that in response to the Scottish Government's consultation when asked the specific question of whether same-sex marriage should be allowed, 64 per cent of responses from within Scotland said it should not. Furthermore, the Scottish for Mar Marriage petition, which opposes the redefin redefinition of marriage, has recently pa uh, passed 53,000 signatures, which I feel demonstrates the enormous strength of feeling on this issue. Based on the figures given to the members tonight, I would suggest that Scotland do, uh, does not support this bill. During the many I'm years sorry, but you need to start winding up. Yes, I know this bill will pass eventually, but this does not stop me from voicing my constituents' concerns. I therefore intend to vote against this bill, conscious of the fact that I would have stood up for my constituents and presented their views on this matter. Finally, in the open debate, John Finney, four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I apologise to you and the Cabinet Secretary for missing the very opening remarks? Um, I was part of the committee that put together this report, and I think it reflects a wide range of views, and I think it's very important that all voices are heard. My colleague, uh, John Mason, who is on the committee, if I heard him correctly, talked about the importance of this in, a, in a negative terms. Well, I have to tell you that, for me, there's little more important than equality and fairness, and I, for that reason, I fully endorse the, the bill. Um, We've, a number of people have talked about changed attitudes, and I think that's been reflected in relation to gender, disability, race and sexual orientation. 
And I have to say, as a police officer who commenced in the mid-70s, I learned laws about homosexuality that seem bizarre and indeed uh, totally unacceptable nowadays. One of the phrases used in the Equality Network um, a recent briefing is marriage, <coughs> excuse me, marriage equality matters to LGBT people, and that's very apparent. And we heard very powerful testimony from Ruth Davis and Marco Biagio, Kevin Stewart, Jim Eady, and, and others. Uh, I received a lot of communications from people of faith. I um, hopefully displayed I was respectful of their views. These were very clearly individual views, their individual interpretation, individually made from self-selected sources. Um, the what the faith groups, uh, I'm sure, will recognise that attitudes have changed, not least to things like mixed-race marriages and divorcees. And if we check with the, the report, you'll see that Professor John Custis talks about, quote, the liberalisation of attitudes even among regular worshippers. What's very clear is there is no requirement to marry and the protection that's been afforded people by Article 9 of the ECHR. And I, for one, would commend the legislative for cooperation with the UK government on aspects of this. Um, I hope at some future point that faith groups will participate, and I commend the humanists, the Quakers, Unitarians, and the liberal Jews, and indeed others. Um, there's not been too much said. I thought there would be more said of registrars. They are public servants, and they should com uh, complete public duty. Um, we wouldn't tolerate any objection to people saying they wouldn't participate in a mixed-race marriage. So, uh, quite frankly, they need to get on with it. There's been a lot of talk of the nature of communications. And unlike Margaret Mitchell, I haven't found opponents to have been in any way inhibited in what they've, they've, uh, their contact with me. I've had individually written letters. I've had the mass postcards. I've had personal representations. And I have to say, given some of the people's strange obsession with physical acts, I found some of them very uncomfortable. Um, like many others, I wasn't alone today getting a communication that started, Dear Frequent Sinner. Um, <laughs> um, I... Um, uh, yeah. um, I, I think I probably was unique in trying to explain when I did respond to someone in r the range of other parliamentary work I got uh, back was nice work Satan. Um, so, that, you know, I think it's important to recognise that there are genuine views strongly held on both sides, and that's maybe not representative of all the faith organisations. The issues raised by the Scottish Transgender Alliance have been touched on and others, and I don't think time will permit me to go into it. What I would uh, uh, commend the Cabinet Secretary for is his comment that he would think further on the issues. There are a number of issues. They are very challenging to discuss, not least the age aspect, but I was reassured what I heard from the Cabinet Secretary at the Equal Opportunities Committee, and I look forward to um, th these issues being addressed. Um, the future will not be without challenges, but it must be without prejudice. Uh, the Bill will make Scotland fairer and more equal, um, an enlightened and inclusive nation, I hope. Equality in love and the opportunity for that love to be publicly displayed via marriage must trump intolerance and inequality. And that will happen if we support the general principles of the Bill tonight. Thank you. We move to the wind-up speeches. I call John, John Lamont. Uh, you have six minutes. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, a few matters in politics today have evoked such emotive engagement as the issue of same-sex marriage. It has been an engagement that has taken place at all levels and indeed across all um, parts of Scottish society. It has taken place between constituents and their elected re representatives, between those elected re representatives themselves and of course between the people of Scotland themselves. Wherever that engagement has taken place, we have found passionate, profound and deeply held views on all sides of the debate. Officer, I speak today as a Church of Scotland elder as well as a Conservative. I therefore understand the anxiety that the proposals for same-sex marriage are causing to churches and religious groups across Scotland. But I also understand and share the desire for religion to remain relevant in our modern 21st century progressive society. Religion is not, after all, afraid of change. It has responded in the past to changing conditions and standards, and the religions that many of us celebrate and enjoy in our lives today are products of the environment that they operate in. You do not even have to go back as far as Leviticus and its pro proclamations on footballs made of pigskin, beard trimming, or bowl-shaped haircuts to prove this point. In the New Testament, the book of Mark is seemingly unequivocal in its opposition to divorce, as is Timothy in its prohibition of the wearing of pearls or gold. Religion has moved on from those times. Indeed, it has done so repeatedly, time and time again. And when it did, it is right that the state recognised and facilitated that evolution. 
This is the point that I would like to stress. Now, I've heard that opposition to same-sex marriage proposals on the basis that they represent an unjustified and unwarranted interference in the affairs of religion by the government, by the state. But such could not be further than the case. If religions do not want to embrace this gradual tide of change, they will not be forced to. Therefore, if anything, this bill will give religious, religions greater freedom and greater autonomy by allowing them to pursue the agenda and the pace of change that they believe to be right when it comes to same-sex marriage. If the change is no change, that would, in my own view, be a sad state of affairs. Our country, our society and our religions would, I believe, be worse off for that. But I recognise that this is a religious, not a political decision. Our role as politicians here today is limited to deciding whether we should enable that process of change, whatever it may be, to occur. I believe that such change is not only right, but that it is inevitable. Religion and the church do not exist in a vacuum. Indeed, they cannot if they are to remain relevant in our society and if they are to continue to act as a credible force for good in our world. That is why that I would urge those who oppose the proposals that we are debating here tonight seriously and critically examine the reasons for their opposition to same-sex marriage and to ask themselves whether they want their religion, their church and their society to fail to embrace change, the time for which has surely come. Very briefly. Harvey. I'm grateful. Would the member also acknowledge that most marriages which are conducted in Scotland at the moment are already civil uh, or indeed conducted by the, the Humanist Society. And so even those who have concerns about the impact on religion should be supporting this bill because of the, the opportunity for people to have civil marriages on the basis of equality. John I mean, I mean, That is my point. I mean, this bill allows the religions and the churches to opt in or opt out as they require and as they want to develop at their own pace. Now, it remains my view that this proposal is about consistency more than it is about equality. Marriage is permitted for one set of individuals, and in order to exclude another set, there has to be a very good reason. I believe that in order to be consistent, and because society accepts same-sex relationships, there is no good reason to exclude them from marriage, certainly not on the basis of what sex the person they fall in love with, love with happens to be. Presiding officer, when I travel around my constituency and visit schools or meet young constituents, the idea of opposition to this bill is met with what I can only describe as bafflement. My experience has been that the younger generations support the proposal's aims for in overwhelming numbers. If religion does not evolve, and if the state does not allow it to evolve when it does, we risk excluding those younger voices from a tradition which is woven intrinsically into the basic fabric of our society. In his eloquent contribution in the debate on same-sex marriage in the House of Lords, the Earl of Courttown warned of this very danger. He implored his fellow peers to allow the next generation not to reject the traditions of yesteryear, but to build on the traditions of the future. These words are as true here as they are in Westminster. Presiding officer, I conclude only by noting that we have, as a society, been here at these crossroads before. In only the last 20 years, we have debated passionately, often robustly, Section 28, the lowering of age of consent, gay adoptions and civil partnerships. In each of those cases, I am proud that eventually our progressive democratic tradition prevailed. Today, presiding officer, we here in the Scottish Parliament have the opportunity of adding our voices to that tradition and the privilege of contributing to our society's progress. I will be voting for this bill tonight. It is the right thing to do for our country, it is the right thing to do for our church, and it is the right thing to do to strengthen the wonderful institution of marriage. Thank you. I call on Jackie Bailey. Ms Bailey, you've got nine minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I think in the main this has been a good and mature debate. And I was struck as I, I'm sure the Chamber is, by many of the contributions made today, some from a very personal perspective, others quite humorous, um, and I have no time to, to mention them all, but, but I will attempt to cover some of the territory. Let me start with Ruth Davidson, because she's right when she says that marriage is a good thing, although I've been married for almost 30 years now. I keep telling myself it's a good thing, but, but, <laughs> but she is right when she talks about the value of extending marriage as an institution. And she made a very personal and powerful contribution, which should give us all pause for thought. Because, you know, it does matter 
to the future nature of our country, and it does matter for our young people what we do tonight. Marco Biaggi spoke about how he felt growing up, and I, I know the area he grew up in, and it can sometimes be pretty unforgiving, believe me, but how he was made just to feel different and somehow less deserving. And providing us with testimony of his own personal journey informs our debate much more richly this evening. I'm going to disagree with Mary Fee, which is always a dangerous thing to do, but Mary Fee said that attitudes are changing, but she said that they were happening at a snail's pace. I actually think that's wrong, because when you look at society's attitudes, they are changing much faster than we can catch up with them. If you go back to the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey that I mentioned before, 2002, 41% of people were in favour of same-sex marriage. You get to 2010, a mere eight years later, 61% favoured same-sex marriage. Now, you know, a 20% shift in opinion on any issue in such a short space of time is hugely significant. John Mason spoke about the importance of tolerating different points of view. And our discussions in here will often be robust, and rightly so, but we do need to move forward together. His concern, shared by some in and outside this chamber, is that the protections are not sufficiently robust. I may well believe that they are, but I know that the Cabinet Secretary will want to look at this so we are assured of the provisions he has made with the UK Government to amend the UK 2010 Equality Act actually are sufficiently robust. But I am mindful that in each of the 10 European countries I listed earlier, the Netherlands, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, France, and most recently England and Wales, who have all passed same-sex marriage laws, have not had any religious or belief body or any celebrant been forced to conduct a same-sex marriage. Now, I accept that it was only recently introduced in England and Wales. But no such claim can be made of the other countries. In the Netherlands, it was passed in 2001. Belgium, 2003. Spain, 2005. And I could go on, but that's 12 years ago, 10 years ago, 8 years ago, respectively. Now, that is quite a while to be able to judge whether the protections are sufficiently robust and whether any church or celebrant has been forced to do something. I'm happy to give John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. I, I mean, I take her point about, uh, on, on specifically on marriage, but would she accept that some of the assurances, say, for adoption agencies have proved not to be solid over time? Jackie Bailey. I think there are many countries who perhaps are moving in a direction where they want to ensure that there is more equality. And I think that, you know, they are taking steps forward appropriately, but ultimately this is a matter of equality. Of course we need to ensure protections are in place, but that does not remove the need to ensure that we are operating as an equal nation. And others have spoken against Elaine Smith, Richard Lyle, Margaret Mitchell, others besides. And I respect their right to hold a different view, but I think, presiding officer, that they are quite simply wrong. Margaret McCulloch talked about agreeing to differ Joan McAlpine quite rightly picked up on that theme. Our society is actually quite mature. We do not always agree with each other. You only need to look at this chamber to see the truth of that. But we can walk out of this chamber, we can leave this chamber, and nevertheless still come together and work together. And Joan McAlpine, in a second, Joan McAlpine is right to reflect that our society will do just that. We are tolerant of each other. We do come to accommodations with each other. That's life. That's how we live it. Happy to give Bob Doris. Uh, I thank Jackie Bailey for, for giving the way. I've listened with interest to, to the vast majority of this afternoon's debate. I wonder if Ms Bailey would agree with me that this debate is not about the competing interests of a traditional view of marriage or a modern view of marriage, but the reason I'll be voting yes this evening is because this piece of legislation allows everyone's views of marriage to be reflected in statute and in Scotland. Jackie Bailey. 
I couldn't agree more. And Jim Eady, like you, in a very powerful speech, set out how the bill will expand freedom for belief organisations who want to marry same-sex same couples, how it will strengthen marriage. And therefore, I agree absolutely with the comments by Bob Doris. That's a first for Bob Doris, too. Um, but Drew Smith and Patrick Harvey spoke about you know, repealing Section 28 and our pride in doing so. Thank you, Drew, for making me feel old and reminding me that you were at school. Um, but, you know, he is right to remember, too, that this was not without consequences, often serious consequences for the LGBT community, as they had to deal with some of the hysteria and homophobic bullying that surrounded the repeal. We need to make sure that that does not happen again. Um, James Dornan also touched on, you know, the ability of this bill to strengthen marriage and talked about the experience of his brother Michael. I think we all look forward to receiving the wedding invitation for the marriage in Lisbon now that we all know about it. But you know it has been an extraordinarily interesting debate. Elaine Murray and Patrick Harvey both remarked on how extraordinary it was that there was agreement across the chamber. Indeed Patrick noted that this was probably the first time he has applauded Ruth Davidson with such enthusiasm. And that may well be true for many of us. And it's not often that I find myself in absolute agreement with Alex Neal, Mark MacDonald, and even, for goodness sake, Kevin Stewart. This must be a truly historic day. But Elaine, Elaine was right to remind us about the glorious diversity of human beings even those who she described as being vertically challenged. Because, you know, we are all different. That's what makes us all so absolutely interesting. And whatever that difference is, we should absolutely be tolerant of each other, but we should respect and celebrate that difference because that is the tapestry of our nation. For me and for many others across the chamber, this is about equality. It's about fairness, it's about social justice, it's about values that I believe we all share. Now, I know that some may be hesitating tonight, but let me ask you this. Just think for a moment. What if your son or your daughter is unsure about their sexuality? What if they have a same-sex partner? Do you really want to deny them the opportunity to marry? I hope not. Can I urge all of you to support the general principles of the bill and ensure that the next generation can marry the person they love. I now call on Alec Neil to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, if you could continue until 7.56. That wouldn't be a problem, presiding officer. <laughs> Uh, can, I, can I begin by reminding the Chamber of what the Equal Opportunities Committee said in its report that it hoped that the members of the Parliament would approach the Stage 1 decision with the same dignified tenor as our evidence sessions and with due respect for a diversity of views. And can I say, I think everybody who has spoken has tried to live up to that ideal, and I think this has been one of the most powerful debates that this Parliament has ever held, and a real tribute to the Parliament. We have heard some wonderful speeches from Ruth Davidson and many others tonight, very, very powerful indeed, putting the case for and powerful speeches putting the case against. Can I begin by dealing with two fairly fundamental points that have been raised by those who don't feel at the moment that they can vote for this legislation tonight? First of all, can I emphasise that in terms of marriage, there are essentially two aspects to marriage. There is the religious aspect and there is the state law aspect. What we are dealing with tonight is the state law aspect of marriage. Because what we believe is that the state should recognise marriage between people of the same sex as well as people of a mixed sex. We are not in any way, and this legislation does not in any way interfere with any religious or beliefs body's approach to marriage. Indeed, there is only one way in which it even touches on it, and that is that those religious organisations and churches, like the Unitarians and like the Quakers, will now be able to have same-sex marriages that they want to carry out, carried out on their premises under their religion, and those marriages now will be recognised by the state. Beyond that, there is no other impact 
of this legislation on marriage uh, is carried out or is defined by or is exercised by or is recognised by uh, the state. What this uh, legislation does, we do not redefine marriage. I think Mary Fee's point, and I've heard the First Minister say, and I think many of us would agree, that this legislation does not in any way redefine our marriage. What it does do, I will in a minute, Jamie, what it does do is extend the eligibility for marriage. And that is the key point of the legislation, that people until now in Scotland have been ineligible for marriage will now be eligible for marriage and for that marriage and the love that that represents to be recognised by the state and by those religious bodies and only those religious bodies who want to recognise those marriages out of their own choice. Jimmy. Jimmy McGregor. Um, I thank the Minister for his usual magnanimity in allowing me an intervention. Um, Minister, I want to put down a marker in this debate because a substantial number of my constituents in the Highlands and Islands have expressed to me their concerns that clauses designed to protect teachers, parents, ministers, foster parents, registrars and public sector workers who hold what I could call traditional views will not be strong enough and might be open to a legal challenge, including at EU level. What specific guarantees can the Minister give that legal safeguards will be watertight? Because my constituents are very anxious indeed for this reassurance. Can the Minister give it to them? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely. And let me come to exactly why. We're giving actually four sets, four sets of guarantees. First of all, there are the guarantees in the legislation itself. And probably the biggest single guarantee is that in order to carry out same-sex marriage, any religious organisation, any belief organisation, any celebrant has to opt in to do so. Uh, it is their decision to opt in. But obviously, they cannot be forced to opt in. And it's not actually just as far as the organisation and the celebrant is concerned. For example, as the bill states... If, for example, the Church of Scotland changed its mind and agreed to recognise and participate in and carry out same-sex marriages, but its own celebrants did not wish to do so, its own ministers did not wish to do so, the ministers still have the right not to opt in. So both the rights of the organisation of the religious body, of the belief body, as well as of the individual celebrants, are absolutely guaranteed in this legislation, which is totally compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. If it hadn't been, the presiding officer wouldn't have approved it as competent legislation. Secondly, on top of that, we have got agreed amendments with your government. Uh, we've been working very closely with them in this. Maria Miller and myself, and we have agreed the amendments that will go into the 2010 UK Equality Act to underline uh, all those relevant uh, protections for people uh, who take a different view or who do not want to participate in same-sex marriage. Some aspects actually go slightly further than the protections already built in under the passage of the UK legislation. The third protection is in relation to education. And my friend, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Le Lifelong Learning, is out to consultation just now on the very point about the impact this will have on educational guidance. And he will announce the outcome of that within the next uh, two to three months. And the final part, which has already been published, is the Lord Advocate's guidance to all the prosecutors in Scotland. And if you read that guidance, it absolutely, explicitly, unequivocally guarantees the rights of those people, both those people who are opposed to the principle of same-sex marriage and to those people who do not wish to participate in or carry out same-sex marriage. So it's not just one set of protections. We are providing four sets of protections specifically around this legislation. And I believe, presiding officer, that that is a very, I will in a, minute, that's a very, very reasonable balance between extending the freedom and the rights 
of those who are entitled to marry, along with extending uh, and guaranteeing the protection for those who disagree with the policy and do not wish to carry out same-sex marriages. Annabel Goldie. Annabel Goldie. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary, and, and I too, like John Lamont, speak as an elder of the Church of Scotland, and I propose to vote for the bill this evening. But I have a concern, Cabinet Secretary, just about the level of protection afforded to, let us assume, a religious community which opts in, but an individual celebrant opts out. And the amendment, as I read it here, to the Equality Act says a person controlling the use of religious or belief premises will not contravene that act by refusing to allow the premise is to be used for a same-sex marriage or a civil partnership. But in fact, the situation is it's not a person within the Church of Scotland. It may be a collective entity like a congregational board, or it may be that having declined to participate in a same-sex marriage, a request is then made to use the church premises for a reception, which is declined. Is that covered under this protection? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, and uh, can I say and tell the Chamber that my intention is to issue the legal text of the proposed amendments to the Equality Act uh, before the completion of Stage 2. We have to agree the legal text with the lawyers in London and the lawyers here. And I think when you take both our bill and the protections in our bill, along with the text of the amendments to the Equality Act, you will see unequivocally that those protections are quite frankly unchallengeable both for the individuals and for the churches. And indeed, they extend to, for example, organists who are essential to a church ceremony. If an organist turns round and says, I refuse to play the organ at a same-sex marriage ceremony, the organist, because the organist is seen as a key part of a, a marriage ceremony, the organist will also be protected from any prosecution for refusing to take part. This is the most comprehensive set of protections imaginable for any piece of legislation that we have ever introduced. And therefore, presiding officer, I believe we have, and I thank Jackie Bailey for emphasizing this point, we have a balanced package. On the one hand, we're extending the freedom and the right of those who wish to engage in same-sex marriage, and at the same time, we've got all these protections for those people who are either against it in principle or who do, do not want to participate. Of course, they will. As brief as possible, Mr. Malik. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Just uh, I want to ask you a scenario where someone actually challenges the, our decision at European courts, and we lose. What protection could you then guarantee? We are very, very clear that there is no chance of a successful appeal to the European Court. Uh, apart from anything else, the European Convention does not give you the right to same-sex marriage in the first place. Uh, but there are other reasons why that I don't have time to go into tonight, why we're absolutely, totally sure that any appeal to the European Court would not be successful. So in summation, presiding officer, I believe that this bill is, as Jackie Bailey and others have said, a balanced package that allows freedom and rights to be exercised by those at the present who cannot exercise them without in any way diminishing or threatening the rights and the freedoms of those who take a different point of view. But more importantly, presiding officer, as has been pointed out by many speakers, what this bill does, it's not the, the actual text of the bill that matters. It's the message that it sends out about 21st century Scotland that we are joining those 16 states in America. We are joining those nine European countries who have already passed this legislation. We are joining our friends south of the border. We are joining all the other countries in South Africa and elsewhere who have already passed this legislation to provide a modern framework of legislation in relation to marriage that recognises the equality of all our people. As Rabbi said, we're all Jock Tamsin's bairns, and all the bairns are entitled to exactly the same treatment right through our law, and including now in relation to marriage law. And I believe this is a historic day for Scotland that future generations will look back and congratulate this Parliament on passing this progressive piece of legislation.
That concludes the debate on stage one of the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 8355 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a stage two timetable for the Landfill Tax Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 8355. Moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 8355, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8356, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage two timetable for the Tribunal Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 8356. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 8356, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8364. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme, I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 8364. Formally moved. Um, Paul Martin has asked to speak against the business motion. Mr Martin, you have up to five minutes. President uh, Austin, I rise on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party uh, to oppose the business motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau. President Officer, members will note that next Tuesday, after great debate, uh, there will be a statement on the Independence White Paper. However, President Officer, the sting in the tail is that the Scottish Government will arrange for an, an inspired parliamentary question next Tuesday morning so that they can launch their White Paper at an event in the Glasgow Science Centre, clearly sidelining the role of the Scottish Parliament. The yeah. 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 It is beyond belief the arrogance and contempt that the Scottish Government display for the Parliament. It makes no sense to anyone other than the Scottish Government why on the very day that they will apparently be setting out their vision for the future of Scotland that they will be sidelining the role of this Parliament. Yeah. Now let me be very clear, President Officer, our position and the position I understand of the other main parties represented on the Bureau. Next Tuesday, there should be a statement to this Parliament, firstly, indicating very Order, clearly... Order. Can we hear the members speak, please? Mr Martin. That there should be a statement here, first, to the Scottish Parliament, with the White Paper at the same time being launched and released to this Parliament. It is the Government's business if the First Minister wants to massage his already inflated ego by then... By then... By then presenting the White Paper carefully to a very carefully selected audience in the Glasgow Science Centre. President Officer, the Chamber... Order. Order. Can members please, could members please settle down? We've just had the most fantastic debate conducted in a great spirit of respect across the Chamber. So can we now have that same kind of respect for speakers who are speaking? President Officer, this Chamber is not the Government's selected audience. This chamber is elected democratically by the Scottish people. The principles that these stand for are written in the parliamentary mace before you. And yes, those words are wisdom, justice, compassion and integrity. For, President Officer, very clearly, the government's approach to what we see before us before this very business programme ensures that the government have no respect for these words. We oppose the business motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. <laughs> I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to respond um, to uh, the business motion. Uh, Mr Pat Fitzpatrick, you've up to five minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. That's ten minutes we could have spent uh, continuing the, the debate that we just had, which I think yeah. was a fantastic debate and a yeah. great advert yeah, yeah. for this Parliament. Yeah, yeah. Presiding Officer. Order. Order. Mr Fitzpatrick. Presiding Officer, the language that's been used by some opposition members as regards this week's business um, has been nothing short of uh, ridiculous. Uh, there, there's other words I could use, but um, especially when you consider just last week during the landmark passing the Stage 3 referendum bill, 
They showed little interest at all in, in, the, in the Stage 3 referendum, so much so that the last nine speakers last week in the debate, none of them came from the no parties. Yeah, they exactly. could have pressed their buttons, but they all sat on their hands. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, the presiding officer, the rank hypocrisy Order. of the opposition, the rank hypocrisy of the opposition on this issue today is further exposed when we look at their behaviour in this chamber just four years ago. Then, Mr. this government, Mr. Fitzpatrick, could you address the I, motion? I, I, absolutely, absolutely. Then, absolutely addressing the motion um, at us and, 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 and the speech given by Mr. Martin. Um, then. This government, as a minority, were delayed in holding a debate on a similar publication on Scotland's future because the opposition voted to block it. Yeah. And, and that, that hypocrisy is, is there on the record for all to see. Presiding officer, to be clear, the Scottish Government are proposing an IPQ will be answered on Tuesday morning prior to the launch, yeah. a launch which will be a press conference, yes. which will... Order. The, the answer to Order. the IPQ will include access to the full contents of the white paper for members and hard copies will additionally be lodged in SPICE. There will then be a ministerial statement by the yeah. Deputy First Minister on Tuesday afternoon and then there will be then a full parliamentary debate on Wednesday allowing the Better Together members to bring their combined wisdom to bear in this chamber. Presiding officer, to any reasonable person, this would yeah. seem to be a comprehensive and balanced proposal. <laughs> Presenting officer, on the opening day of this parliament in 1999, Donald Dewar said many, many things which are often quoted, but I will quote just one. A Scottish parliament, not an end, a means to greater ends. Yes. Perhaps the MSPs from the no camp feigned outrage is because they know that next Tuesday marks a significant milestone yeah, of yeah. Scotland's journey to those greater ends. Yeah, yeah. An independent parliament with the powers to build a better, a fairer Order. and a more Order. Let's hear the Scotland. member. I move the motion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I now put the question to the chamber. The question is that motion number 8364 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 8364 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is as follows. Yes, 6 to 4. No, 54. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is decision time, to which we now come. There are five questions. The first question is at motion number 8347 in the name of Joanne Lamont on a motion of condolence for Helen Eady be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 8348.3 in the name of Keith Brown, which seeks to amend motion number 8348 in the name of Joanne Lamont on the future of the defence industry in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 8348.3 in the name of Keith Brown is as follows. Yes, 63. No, 54. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore agreed to. 
The next question is Amendment No. 8348.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser, which seeks to amend Motion No. 8348 in the name of Joanne Lamont on the future of the defence industry in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. Result of the vote on Amendment Number 8348.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser is as follows: Yes, 54; No, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that Motion Number 8348 in the name of Joanne Lamont, as amended, on the future of the defence industry in Scotland, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 8348 on the future of the defence industry in Scotland in the name of Joanne Lamont as amended is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 55. There were one abstention. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 8327 in the name of Alex Neil on the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 8327 on the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill is as follows. Yes, 98. No, 15. There were five abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.